Kansas City Royals. The Tigers won game one behind the power pitching of Jack Morris. And this, a vivid evidence, a strikeout of George Brett. The Tigers had home run power to go with Jack Morris's pitching, the most notable, Alan Trammell. That home run to go with a triple and a single, the hitting star of the evening for the Tigers. But the key play of the game, bottom of the third, bases filled, two out. George Brett, sinking line drive, great catch by Kirk Gibson. It's the American League Championship Series. It's another beautiful night here in Royal Stadium in Kansas City. No threat of rain, temperature in the 70s, and the wind not a factor, only a mild breeze. And last night, to set the scene for you, hello again, everyone. I'm Howard Cosell. Good to have you with us for Game 2 of the American League Championship Series. Last night, the Tigers manifesting the same kind of team strength and versatility that they had almost the entire season of 84, where they won 104 games, were too much for the Kansas City Royals, who were the surprise winners in the West. But the Royals have been through despair before, a fact of which I reminded Dick Hauser. Dick, I want to take you back in time. You dropped five in a row to the Yankees at the stadium. Leave the ballpark a forlorn group, apparently out of things. Fall to 11 below 500. And yet, your team never faltered, and above all, neither did you. What was your thought process? Howard, I just felt like we still had two and a half months left in the season. If, if somebody didn't bury us early on in the season, we weren't buried in May or June. We weren't buried in July. We still had a chance. We got Wilson and Brett back. We've been a much better club the last two and a half months of the season. But one thing in particular, our young pitchers have pitched good all season. And as the season went along, they were a little bit better in August and September. That put us over the hump. You're young pitchers, and one of them is Brett Saberhagen. And this kid will be the youngest kid ever to take the mound in postseason game as the starting pitcher. Younger even than Jim Palmer, younger than Valenzuela, younger than an old friend of yours, John Padres. Can he stand up to this kind of pressure? Well, he has all season. I think early on in the season, real pressure was coming out of spring training, 19 at that time, and making a major league ball club, pitching well the first part of the season when we didn't score runs. But I think the key is the last couple of times out, 16 consecutive scoreless innings against the California Angels, games that we had to win, that's when Saberhagen was at his best. We're hoping he can do that again tonight. That to you is pressure equivalent to this start tonight. I don't think it's quite the same. I'll be honest and admit that uh, this is a little bit different, but I do think there's always pressure in this business. Must games in September are very tough. These games are even more important. Peppery little guy, Hauser. And Jim Palmer was but a few days short of being 21 when he pitched his first game, World Series game, in postseason play, beating Koufax 6 to nothing in 66. Now Saberhagen, even younger than you were then, and you had an interesting talk with Dick Hauser behind the batting cage about Saberhagen. Describe it. Well, we talked last night how important it is for the young pitchers of Kansas City to get the game to Dan Quisenberry, 44 saves for Quisenberry, 45 last year. I said, Dick, is this guy, I mean, who's this guy like? Is he like Mel Stottlemyre? And he looks a lot like him. He also looks a little bit like Bert Blylove, and, and he has the same kind of fastball, Howard. He's very sneaky. But he said, no, the guy he reminds of most of is Catfish Hunter, and I could not think of a better pitcher to be <laughs> reminded of, especially when you need to win the ball game. And tonight, of course, is a must game. Uh, the important thing is that he goes out there, and as Dick Hauser said, he has pitched exceptionally well. Uh, he beat California in his last start 4 nothing, a complete game. And when they asked him after the game, they said, well, how did you do it? He said, I grew up in California. I saw the Angels. He said, I knew how to pitch to them, and I did it. Well, he saw last night's game. He saw now not how to pitch to Detroit. And I just hope that he kind of comes back and retains his poise. And that's very hard for a 20-year-old 20 kid, 20 kid to do in this situation. But he has an outstanding arm. He has a, not a great breaking ball, but pretty good control. And I, I just hope he pitches well tonight. Well, if he can pitch like Catfish Hunter, he'll be a winner. The flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? 
Olita Adams, the national anthem. It's another perfect night. Temperature in the mid 60s, clear skies in Kansas City for game two. Game two of the American League Championship Series is being brought to you by Chevrolet. See today's Chevy. Drive today's Chevy. Live today's Chevy. By Stroh's and Stroh Life, proud sponsors of the Stroh's Run for Liberty. By RCA, creators of video technology that excites the senses. And by General Motors, extra time, extra effort, and attention to every detail. GM is committed to excellence. Attention behind the Royals dugout for tonight's ceremonial first pitch, which will be thrown by the First Lady of the Royals, Mrs. Muriel Kaufman. Mrs. Kaufman, fire away when ready. Thank you, Mrs. K. <laughs> and now, let's play ball. Starting lineup for the Detroit Tigers, leading off Lou Whitaker. Then, the man who's irrepressible, Alan Trammell. After him, Kirk Gibson. You've just heard about Gibby's improvement. Then Lance Parrish, RBI and home run leader of the team. Darrell Evans will be playing third tonight. Bats next. Rupert Jones and will be developing his story tonight. And then Johnny Grubb, a one-time All-Star. Chet Lemon after Grubb. And then finally, Dave Bergman. That's the Tigers' starting lineup, Mr. Michaels. And defensively, Howard, Kansas City remains the same. Same lineup tonight for them. Steve Balboni, as we look at their defenses at first base. The steady Frank White is the second baseman. And the hottest hitter in the American League after the All-Star break, Onyx Concepcion at shortstop. With George Brett, 0 for 4 last night at third base. In the outfield, Darrell Motley is in left field. Center fielder. The man who covers all the ground out there in the spacious park, Willie Wilson. And the right fielder is Pat Sheridan. Back of the plate is Don Slott. And on the mound is the youngest man in baseball history to ever start a postseason game. He becomes that tonight. 20 years old, Brett Saberhagen. Youngest man to ever start a league championship series or a World Series game. The umpires, again, Bill Deegan is back of the plate, John Bible at first, Randy Crystal at second. There are the others, Jones, Denny, and Nothnagel. So they go with Deegan again behind the plate. He did a very good job last night. Lou Whitaker leads off for Detroit, and the count is 1-0. and oh. Whitaker, Trammell, and Gibson in the first inning. With the Tigers sitting very pretty right now. Even if they lose tonight, they go home even, and the rest of the series is in Detroit as Whitaker tries to bunt his way on. And the count is one and one. And Howard, you know, in that conversation I had with Dick Hauser before the game about Saberhagen, he said the most impressive thing about him is he went to the Instructional League last fall and he walked one batter in 46 innings. So we can expect to see a lot of strikes tonight. Hit foul off to the left. Saberhagen, earlier in the season, was being used as a reliever. He pitched exceptionally well down the stretch against California as the Royals had a good month of September to overtake the Twins and the Angels and win the division by three. Two years ago, Saberhagen in high school in the San Fernando Valley in California. Went to Cleveland High School in Reseda. The Royals, Howard, was scouting him. He had a sore arm. His senior season played a lot of shortstop, but still they knew he could pitch. Signed him as a pitcher, and here he is two years later in the playoffs. Seems a very self-possessed kid. Very confident in his speech, at least. What was that, Jim? As you look there at the ball. What was well, that, that was Jim? Just Dick was telling you about he doesn't pitch low. Well, he does pitch low, but he also pitches high. He has good enough fastball where he can get it up in the strike zone, something that Bud Black couldn't do last night. He just has a good arm. And there you see that fastball. And basically, if, if he had his brothers and throwing that fastball at 93 miles per hour, he'd like to keep the ball down in the strike zone, but he has an effective enough fastball to come up and in on the hitters and keep them aware for that breaking ball away. And the 3 2 pitch to Whitaker is fouled away. Last night, the Tigers got rolling early as Whitaker singled and then Trammell tripled. Before the inning was over, the Tigers had two and never looked back as they won 8 to 1. 
basically what happened, Al, is that Whitaker has done the same thing. He ran the count to three and two. You have to throw him a strike, and he singled. Chopper hit toward the middle, and Concepcion would have had to hustle the throw. It would have been very close, and as it turns out, Whitaker is aboard at first base. We'll see how they score. And it would have been a very close play on a slowly hit bouncer. So again, the Tigers have the leadoff man on, as was the case last night. It's caught in an error. Could have really scored it either way, taking into account Whitaker's speed, which is above average. We must find a way to stop Alan Trammell, Hauser told me. And, Jim, you were there. And we said you must find a way to stop this whole line. There goes Whitaker. Trammell is an exceptional hit and run man. Fouling it away. A lot of people in the American League who follow it closely feel that Trammell is the best. But here he fouls lead. it away and the count is 0-1. Well, we saw it last night. He tripled over Motley's head in left field. Then he homered to left, walked a couple of times, and then when a Huseman made a nice pitch away, he singled the right field. So he can move the ball around. He can hit the ball out of the ballpark. And that's why, as we said last night, he's one of was the most valuable player candidate until he hurt his shoulder in midseason. Tigers do not do a lot of running. Gibson leads the team in steals, but that doesn't mean they're not a fast team. They move from first to third very well on base hits. He doesn't go this time, and it's fouled away, and the count is nothing in two. The just saw him obviously try to go to right then. Travel type of hitter that if he gets. The pitch he can drive, as he proved last night, tripling to left field. He's got some power. He talked about his closed stance. O2 pitch in the air to deep right center field, but a spacious ballpark, and Willie Wilson is able to roam back to make the catch as Whitaker tags at first and advances to second. So at least Lou, knowing that Wilson had room, was able to get back and move himself into scoring position on a long fly ball to center. One away, and Gibson is the batter. Now that's an interesting stat right there. And as Whitaker took second on that long fly, an early evidence again of the aggressive type of baseball that a Sparky Anderson managed team plays. We saw repeatedly last night how even when they were ahead, eight to one. He kept using everybody on the roster playing to win not to pile it up to win many managers in baseball and many football coaches once they have a lead try to sit on it to play not to lose Anderson has never played that that was an appeal play right there and it was denied key difference don't you agree Jim playing not to lose and playing to win. Well, it's a very important difference. Of course, Sparky does have the horses to play that way. That's true. Saberhagen working on Gibson. Takes a strike. Saberhagen, he is, a, or was going into the season, used to performing in a major league ballpark when he was at Cleveland High School in Reseda, California, in the city championship game. They held it at Dodger Stadium, and he wound up pitching a no-hitter two years ago. A little different circumstances this time. They thought time was called, but Deegan said no. And the pitch is inside, so it is a gift ball. And the count is one and one. The gift to Gibson, in as much as he had backed out, and had the pitch been over, it would have been a strike. And the well, count I have think the pitch two. was over, Al. I think Bill Deegan lost his concentration there when Gibson yeah. did. Could have been. That's hit into the right field corner, and here are the Tigers on top again as Whitaker comes in to score on a double by Gibson. And the Tigers have been extremely potent in the first inning this season. 129 runs they scored during the regular season in the first. This is sort of typifies the way Detroit began the season, blowing teams out early. Just not a very good pitch by Saber Hagen. Gibson, of course, having a tremendous year, jumps on it. A lot of times you just kind of reach out for it and fly out, but he's hot. 
And we see the double down the right field line. Well, quickly, we're back to the same storyline. They'd better shut the Tigers down quickly if they want to stay in this ball game because you play a seven-inning game with either team. When you've got Hernandez and Quisenberry, and you're leading at the end of seven, it's curtains on balance. Parrish is the batter, and the count is 1-0 oh on Lance, who in some ballparks would have hit three home runs last night. As it was, he settled for one and a sacrifice fly and a 400 foot out. I told him you're taunting us upstairs with wanting track power. He says, what do you mean wanting track power? My ballpark, I have three. Yeah. Several ballparks he has three last night. Fouled away out of play. And the count is two and one. Think about Parrish and Wrigley Field if they get there in the World <laughs> Series. But you won't want to sit in the bleachers. Yeah, I know everybody <laughs> likes to do it, but it may be dangerous. Well, the Cubs 2 and 0. Tigers trying to go 2 and 0. Last time the Cubs were in the series in 45, they faced Detroit. And that's hit into right field for a base hit and maybe more. It will score Gibson. Parrish is being waved around first by Krzyzewski and into second with a double. And it's 2 to nothing. Started the season with nine straight wins, then Saberhagen beat him. They were 35 and 5. As we look at the double again to make the score two to nothing. Not a particularly bad pitch up and in, but when you're as strong as Lance Parrish, you fight those balls off. A lot of guys that don't have the power to hit 33 home runs, they get jammed, they pop out to second baseman, or maybe even the first baseman. He just fought it off. Not a bad pitch, but it didn't turn out very well for Saberhagen. As Evan stands in. To finish the point, this is very much in the manner in which the Tigers got off to the start this season. If you go back and check the box scores and the line scores of those early games, they were scoring five and six runs in the first inning. They off times were leading by scores of something like seven or eight to one by the fourth, and literally not only winning, but just blowing people away early. And those early season victories were recorded in the main against teams from the American League West. Mm -hmm. Evans fouling it back, and the count is two and one. Parrish at second base. One away. Sparky juggling his lineup as you look at Dick Hauser behind Mike Ferraro, his third base coach. The 2 1 pitch. Evans hits it in the air to shallow left field. Concepcion goes out, but Motley calls him off and makes the catch for the out. Two down with Parrish still the second, and Rupert Jones is the batter. Here's a guy who was notorious for going after the bad pitches, swinging at them, looking at the good ones. Now, after that stint we talked about that he served in the minor leagues, he's come back, and there is the graphic. It speaks for itself. He's been enormously effective, and he's been hitting the pitches that he should hit and taking the ones that he shouldn't. I really feel when he played for the Mariners up in Seattle that he felt that he had to do a lot of it by himself so therefore he's probably a little bit too aggressive when he went to the Yankees again the expectation level was very high you go to New York you think you got to be a superstar he fits perfectly into this lineup Harris at second 0 and 1 some of his mannerisms look familiar well, when he first came up it struck everybody he had a lot of the same mannerisms as Reggie Jackson as he climbed into the batter's box, held the bat. Of course, he grew up in Oakland. Reggie was one of his idols. It looks a little bit like Reggie. Yeah. And now the comparison stops. <laughs> oh, well, how do you know what kind of a broadcaster he is? We haven't tried Jones yet. <laughs> Alfalfa is starting early. Yes, that he is. <laughs> I give Roof his due. I can see from the first two pitches they're trying to get him out inside at least they established the inside corner now they're going away. Ground ball speared by Saberhagen and he gets out of the inning without any further damage but as was the case last night two runs two hits and a man left after a half Tigers two Royals coming up. Nothing works like a Chevy truck. Nothing works like a Chevy truck. So bring out the sun. Bring on the fun. You got the goods. Kansas City Royals leading off Willie Wilson. 
He was followed by Pat Sheridan, and then comes George Brett. After Brett, it's the dangerous hitting George Otter. After Otter, it's Daryl Motley, and the big smile from the guy who looks like No Neck Williams. Then comes Steve Balboni, the striking out man and slugger. Then second baseman Frank White after that. Don Slott, the catcher. And winding it up, Onyx Concepcion, the shortstop. There you go, Mr. Michaels. And defensively, as we look at the Tigers, they go tonight with Dave Bergman at first base. Evans was there last night, but he's moved over to third. There's Lou Whitaker at second. Great double play combination. Alan Trammell, those two. Both coming up as rookies in 1978. And Darrell Evans, the versatile one, at third. He started his career there with Atlanta. In the outfield, Rupert Jones is in left. He platoons with Larry Herndon. The everyday center fielder is Chet Lemon. And the everyday right fielder, Kirk Gibson, who played in more games than any other Tiger this season. Back of the plate, the American League's all-star catcher, Lance Parrish, with his 33 homers this year. And the pitcher is Dan Petrie, who forms a very formidable one-two punch along with Morris. And this year, they're joined by Wilcox, who will start on Friday night for an outstanding one-two-three punch for Sparky Anderson all season long. Tigers on top. Two to nothing as Willie Wilson starts things off. Wilson, Sheridan, and Brett. Petrie with 18 victories this season. Mike Boddicker was the only 20 game winner in the American League. And Joaquin Andujar, the only man to win 20 in the National. Burt Blylevin and Jack Morris in the American each won 19. And then Petrie and Frank Viola next with 18 wins. Foul tip. No balls and one strike on Wilson to be followed by Sheridan and Brett. Some think Petrie is a stronger pitcher even than Morris. Well, I wouldn't go that far, Howard, but he's an excellent pitcher. Won 19 games last year, 18 this year, and there you see another good fastball. Throws over 90 miles per hour, 94 to be exact. Probably has the best slider in the American League, and that's quite a statement, especially for a right-handed pitcher. Throws a occasional fork ball and maybe an occasional curveball, but when he gets in trouble, and if he is going to be on the night, you're going to see him with a good slider. I think something to say about Willie Wilson. And this statistic speaks for itself. 52 and 13 when he gets on base more than two times in a ball game. If the Royals want to get back in this game. Wouldn't be a bad place to start with Willie. Broken bat, the grounder to short, surrounded by Trammell, hurries his throw and still gets him. Now we talked about Trammell last night and his shoulder injury and the fact that he's not throwing as well as he normally does, but still, and especially with Wilson here getting rid of it in a hurry. Throw a little bit low, but in time to get him. That's the best test he's had thus far. He says that on plays like this one, he doesn't even think about his arm, and that's what enables him to execute the way he just did. Well, they really have a better defensive club tonight yeah. than they did last night. Bergman's better at first. Jones is better than left field. Evans is a good third baseman, probably more familiar over at third than he has it is at first. So if it's possible. After going 7-0 here at Royal Stadium, they have a better defensive club. One and one the count now on Pat Sheridan. Questioning the call. Well, there's that high strikeout. And as we said last night, with the outside protector, and you can see it there on umpire Bill Deegan, you're going to get more high strikes and low ones. Two balls and one strike the count. Umpiring no factor at all here last night, as was the case in Wrigley Field basically today. Earl Weaver summing it up when he said if you don't notice them they're obviously doing a good job three and one account or else the flow of play doesn't test true one out of the base is empty bounce to the right side and an easy play for Whitaker to take care of Sheridan and that's the second out of the first inning as George Brett comes up Brett this season was three for four against Petrie, and two of those three hits were homers. First time since 1978 that George wound up the regular season under 300. And as uh, all fans who follow the game know, on the disabled list through the middle of May with 
a knee injury and then missed several games in August and September with a torn hamstring. One and all the count. At Kansas City during the regular season, the Tigers did not lose here. KC won five of six there and tack on the win last night and the Tigers are seven and oh in this park in 84. That's what we call last night the road field advantage. Yeah. I guess looking at those two statistics, this is kind of a must win situation for the Tigers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good way to put it. Uh, they better win tonight or it's all over. I'm not sure that's really the case, but I'm not either. Red fouling it away. But I think a very valid point again going back is Kansas City in this ballpark and now you talked about how spacious it is. It's tough to hit home runs especially for them because Kansas City does only has really two guys that I consider home run hitters and that's Balboni and the man we're looking at right here George Brett. And if you pitch Brett away in this ballpark he's content with singling and doubling the left field. Fly ball to shallow center field it's Lemon coming charging in makes the catch to retire the side. Petrie sets them down in order. We played one full in game two and the Tigers lead Kansas City 2 nothing. Dick Hauser talking about tonight's pitcher 20 year old Brett Saberhagen. Brett Saberhagen is a young guy. The only thing that people questioned was the fact that he was only 19 years old coming out of spring training. But I saw his stats in the minor league when he went from a ball to double A his stats didn't drop off. I saw him in the instruction league. I liked him. I saw him in spring training. The thing that got my attention the reason he's pitching the second game against Detroit the last two times he's pitched against the California Angels 16 consecutive scoreless innings beat him here in Kansas City 91 pitches in nine innings just completely dominated the California Angels. That's the reason he's pitching against Detroit not the fact that he's three and one on the season. Go with a man who pitched well for you down the stretch. And he did two masterpieces really against the Angels. Johnny Grubb, much traveled, Saber popped up in the shallow center field. Willie Wilson takes charge, and on one pitch, Grubb is retired. One out of the second inning, and Chet Lemon comes up as they drop Lemon to number eight in the order. Last night he hit seventh against the left-hander Bud Black. 287 during the regular year with 20 homers and 76 RBIs. They sure do have the horses. Well, they do, and I think this. the postscript to what Dick Hauser said about Saberhagen is that the Tigers are not the Angels. The Angels did not hit well the last two weeks of the season. They didn't hit, period. Well, Reggie did. Well, Reggie did not really hit that well either. He had a couple of games where he did hit some home runs. Spun down to short, fielded by Concepcion, and he throws him out at first. Clemens had a habit of doing that, diving into the bag, which they tried to get him out of the habit of doing. That's how that he hurts a, his hands and wrists. That ball really had a lot of spin on it. He hit it right down off the end of the bat. A little trickier than it looks. Also one of those balls you don't get out of the box too well on. And as you said Howard it's not particularly a good play if you want to play the entire season. And I'm not really sure you get there any faster when you dive. Usually you got to slow down a little bit. So two down and Dave Bergman comes up batting 273 during the regular year. Certainly when you dive head first. Oh, and one to count. Dave Bergman. He was the other man in the deal that they acquired from Philadelphia along with Willie Hernandez. Tigers sent Glenn Wilson and John Wackenfuss in that deal to Philadelphia. Actually, it was a three way deal because Bergman had left the Giants to go to Philadelphia as part of the transaction. With San Francisco getting a fellow by the name of Al Sanchez, who wound up as the player of the year in the Pacific Coast League. And a one two pitch. That remains a ball and two strikes with two out of the bases empty. Second inning on a beautiful night in Kansas City and the Tigers on top two to nothing. Tomorrow Cubs go to San Diego with Eckersley and Whitson. Night game eight Eastern time. We're off tomorrow. Teams travel to Detroit. Game three at Tiger Stadium Friday night. Grounded toward the middle. White is there. Plants throws doesn't get him though. 
as Bergman legs it safely to first base. White might have thought he had a little more time than he actually did there. Well, Bergman really got down the he line did. now. One of those high choppers. Got a good jump out of the box. Looks like White threw it as quick as he can. It was safe. That was a good call. And Bergman got down there faster than I thought he had the ability to do. Well, he's like, again, we talked about the role players that the Tigers acquired. Good defensive player. Home run threat, not maybe here in Kansas City, but definitely in Detroit with that short porch. Here is Whitaker. Reached on an error in the first inning. All on one account. One of the Tiger runs unearned in the first. That call could have gone either way. He joined us late. Whitaker hitting a grounder to short. Concepcion bobbling it. But even had he fielded it cleanly, it would have been 50 50 whether he would have gotten him or not. Then doubles by Gibson and Parrish. And it's 2 0 Tigers. They send the runner. The pitch is low and inside. And Slot's throw doesn't get him as White had to worry about Bergman coming in. And Franklin, a nice play just to save him from going into center field. I think he may have pulled a hamstring, Al. You'll see, I think, in this rape replay that as he goes to first, you can see him kind of slow down. Just getting underneath. Frank White making an acrobatic grab of the throw from slot. And that's exactly where he's reaching for the right hamstring. Also the foot. Now actually he's trying to stretch it out. It's one of those situations you don't know if you pull the hamstring or you have a cramp. I hope it's a cramp because they go away a lot quicker than a pulled hamstring. One of those plays it looks like if Frank White had been to the base he got a little bit late in getting there. Might have had a chance to tag Bergman out. Then again, Bergman's not the type of guy that you expect to be running. No, that's what took the surprise. Tigers, 106 steals this year, same number as Kansas City. Another look, and you can see goes right underneath the tag as the throw is right in the neighborhood. But in an unpropitious spot, really, for Frank White to be able to make the tag. Alex Grammis, third base coach, seems satisfied that Dave can gut it out. Bergman stole three bases during the regular season. Was caught four times. Wrapped foul off to the left, and the count is one ball and two strikes on Whitaker. Charlie Liebrand is scheduled to start for KC on Friday against Milt Wilcox as we move to Tiger Stadium for game three. Friday night, 8 o'clock Eastern Time. One ball, two strikes to count. Tigers on top, 2 nothing, Leading in the series, one game to nothing. Quick breaking pitch. Took something off it. Had Whitaker out in front. And Saberhagen ends the second inning with his first strikeout. No runs, no one hit. And they leave Bergman at second after one and a half. Tigers, two. Royals nothing. His battery mate, Lance Parrish. Dan Petrie is uh, a guy that I always knew all along would uh, would be an outstanding pitcher. He's had the ability. He's got probably the liveliest fastball on the ball club, a fastball that uh, takes off in uh, a number of directions. I really don't think uh, in his mind he knows where it's going half the time, but it explodes. The... Uh, He's got a tremendous slider, which is probably his best pitch. He uh, he's just got a lot of confidence in himself right now, and he's uh, he's never given up. He's given us uh, an honest effort the whole season long, and uh, consequently he's won 18 ball games. He leads here two nothing, starting the bottom of the second. And George Orta takes on side ball one. Orta, Motley, and Balboni are the batters for the Royals in the bottom of the second inning. George Orta. Came over in a one-for-one -one deal with Toronto for Willie Akins. Fouling it away. Got to remember that Petrie is a little more than six feet, four inches tall. Imposing figure out there, Jim. Certainly is. He seen a lot of small pitchers have great stuff, but they talk about leverage. The guy that's 6'4 certainly has it. Round into third. Struggle there by Evans. Recovered. 
scores and still throws Lorna out at first base. So Evans playing in about even with a bag and able to keep it in front of him. Scooping it up and Darrell with a good arm to get him. Well, they talk about third base being a reflex position. On the turf, the ball sometimes comes back. It kind of went back towards his right foot, but he did keep it in front of him. He makes just a accurate throw to first for the out. Darrell Motley went 0 for 4 last night. Strike. Motley last year was sent to the minors and they had no room for him at the Royals AAA club in Omaha. So what they did is they sent him to Evansville, which is the Tiger Farm Club on loan. It's a situation that's not particularly uncommon in baseball. Motley saying earlier this year he felt more like a Tiger really than a Royal after last season. Well, as a lot of young players do, he just had a lot of holes. Chase the high fastball, the breaking ball in the dirt. This year he's been a little bit more disciplined. He makes the pitcher throw strikes, and when he does, he has great natural ability. Look at that graphic. They win with him in there. I don't know that he's the only reason, but it makes him look good. Two and two. Well, I think some of the others that played left field were George Orta, who's never been known for his glove. Mostly his bat. And there you saw that moving fastball that Lance Parrish talked about from Petrie. When you go to hit it, it's in the middle of the plate. When you catch it, it's almost got your right ankle. Popped up near second, and it's Whitaker putting it away. Five straight set down by Petrie. Last night, Morris started the game by retiring seven straight. And at one point, Jack retired ten in a row. Whitaker reaching on an error, then RBI doubles by Gibson and Parrish. Providing the Tigers with their runs in the first inning. Right now we're in the bottom of the second inning. The error charge to Onyx Concepcion. Detroit on top. 2-0 as they were at this juncture last night. And Steve Balboni. 0-1. Dunn has Petrie at 94 on that last pitch. Steve Balboni. Came over from the Yankees. Looks at a strike. Got 0 and 2. He's been their RBI man this season. 77 to lead the club, then 28 home runs to lead the club. In his first ever real shot at making it. Dick Hauser was telling Balboni in the spring, "You're my guy. You're going to get 500 at bats this season." Well, he didn't quite get that many, but. Well, that was because of injuries. Exactly. Up about 450 times, 139 strikeouts, but a lot of home runs, and that's what they want. But how's it was telling them is that don't worry about it. I'm going to stick with you. You're not going to be platoon. You're going to get your shot finally. Well, that's a common thread that runs between Dick Hauser and Sparky Anderson. The players that play for both these managers know that they have confidence in their players. Breaking pitch got him swinging. And the out will be officially recorded at first base after Paris drops it. We play two, still Detroit two, Kansas City nothing. For the fourth year in a row, Royals are currently struggling. Yankee owner George Steinbrenner said on my sports beat show they would have finished sixth in the East, shouldn't be here. Here was George Gretz's retort when I told him. Well, if George was smart enough to buy the Royals instead of the Yankees, he would have been in the playoffs this year. <laughs> but he wanted to buy the Yankees instead of the Royals, so that's why they're not in the playoffs. Uh, each each division has to have a representative, and we're very thankful that, uh, I guess this year, that we weren't in the um, American League East because we would be in sixth place. And uh, anything can happen in a three out of five series. I remember in 1977, we won 102 games, lost 60. The best record in all of baseball, we lost to the Yankees in the playoffs. So. If we go out and play to our capabilities, our potential, we can win it, and uh, just hopefully we will. Well put by Brett, whose team is in a hole right now, though. Down one game to nothing and down two nothing in the score here in game two as we strike the third, and Alan Trammell takes a strike. Trammell, perfect night last night. Single, triple, homer, two walks. Fly to center in the first inning today. 
One ball, one strike. Well, Willie Aikens, longtime first baseman here, traded to Toronto for Huerta with the Blue Jays this year, but back home in Kansas City and watching his ex-mates. Had a terrible year with the Jays. I find it interesting that he'd be here tonight. One thing that's impressed me about Saberhagen that you notice, as we said, excellent control. Tigers score two runs. It hasn't altered his game plan. He's still throwing strikes. Broken bat bouncer to Balboni. Over to Saberhagen covering. One away here in the third inning. That will be Kirk Gibson. You know, if Steinbrenner talking about where the Royals would have finished and the retort from Brett, everything is so relative in baseball. Last year, as you look at the Tigers when they score the first run how dominant they've been last year Kansas City finished second but they finished 20 games back of the White Sox so it was a bad year they won 79 games you realize as Gibson fouls it away they only won five more games this year than they did last but here they are in the playoffs they won 84 in 1984 matter of geography yep but I do think an interesting thing about the way the American League is set up, you play more games outside your division than you do inside. Kansas City played a tougher schedule than the six teams that finished ahead of them in the American League East. They had to play 84 of their games against the, the East, while the American League East teams only had to play 78 games against the East. But figure out why that happens, I don't know, but that's the way it is. Matter for you to rectify in your forthcoming role as assistant to the commission. <laughs> I will get the umpires back on the field, Howard. <laughs> I know that'll make you happy. <laughs> Two one pitch. Now three and one on Gibson. Will be followed by Parrish. Well, I thought Earl asked a rather good question today. Why do we have six here? And I asked Bobby Brown, American League president, last night, you recollect, and the National League still had only four today. Foul back. What's your position on that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I would say that. Did Chuck Feeney go to medical school? <laughs> I don't really know. There's, I don't think if you really any, want to know. Believe. He went to Columbia High School in South Orange, <laughs> New Jersey, and matriculated at Dartmouth College in the hills of Hannibal. Well, then they ought to have six umpires. <laughs> That's right. Foul back, and it's still three balls and two strikes on Gibson. I really don't think it takes a whole lot of acuum to call balls fair and foul, and that's what the fifth and sixth umpires usually do. It just seems that when you consider the past history. They usually do have six umpires in the playoffs in the World Series. A little bit of an oversight not to happen. To deep center field. And all the way back goes Wilson. And that ball is gone. That's Gibson. And has he coming along? And because of the way Sparky talked about him and because of the way Gibson talked with us, that's exactly why we elected at the advent of this telecast to show his play of the game last night and talk about his improvement. He is coming into his own. Kirk Gibson, 27 during the regular season. He is doubled and homer tonight. He had two hits last night in addition to the defensive play. And the Tigers are on top three to nothing. And we see a fastball in the middle of the plate. Sparky kind of alluded to the fact that he once compared him to Mickey Mantle. And we see one of his abilities to hit the ball as far as Mickey Mantle, just about. That ball was belted. That one would impress even Reggie Roo. 1-1 one, one pick. 1-2. One Reggie Smith. <laughs> oh, you're looking for it tonight, Alfalfa. <laughs> well, they won't. They both went to the same college. <laughs> That's right. So did you. <laughs> One two pitch. The deep right field. But fading and having room is Sheridan. Certainly to make the catch. So with two down, that sort of sums up the reaction of uh, some of the Kansas City fans at this particular point. Team surprising everybody by getting into the playoffs to begin with, but routed last night by the Tigers. And this has 
those same makings tonight, at least at the outset. We keep giving Darrell a San Francisco routine. I don't know why. He still lives in the Bay Area as the organist salutes him with I left my heart in San Francisco, which he didn't since he played out his option and was signed by the Tigers. <laughs> One and though the count. Change up missing and it's two and all. Darrell Evans been around a long time. Came up with the Braves in 69. He was eligible for the playoffs in 69 between the Braves and the Mets, but never got into a game as he rips it to right field. Sheridan does a 360, but makes the catch. So Saberhagen is not fooling anybody. He gets out of the inning after the home run by Gibson. That's all, but still, it's Detroit 3, Kansas City nothing after two and a half. This is Mr. Goodrich, and did you know there are ways you can tell if your GM car's shock absorbers are okay? For one, check your tires. If they show unusual wear, like cupping at one spot. Field, a double and a homer tonight. Tigers lead 3-0. Here's Kirk talking about his future. Potential is, but I just know there's a lot of room, uh, room for improvement in a lot of areas, and there's a lot of good people around me. Sparky has helped me tremendously. When I came into this game professionally, I did not know the game of baseball. I didn't know... <laughs> when to bunt, uh, when to steal. I didn't know how to field the ball or how to throw it. And uh, I've got the mechanics down now, so mechanically I'm a lot more sound than I used to be. Kirk Gibson, four hits already in the playoffs as we go to the bottom of the third inning. Tigers on top, 3 nothing. Obviously the hamstring pulled, bothering Dave Bergman, he has come out of the game as we start the bottom of the third inning, and Frank White to lead off against Dan Petrie, who's retired the first six, and it's a strike. There's Tommy Brooken now playing third, and what they've done is take Darrell Evans from third, moved him over to first. Brookins bats in Bergman's spot, number nine in the order. Bergman getting injured on the stolen base in the second inning, sliding under the tag of that man, Frank White with a career-high 17 homers this year. One and two. White, Slot, and Concepcion. The bottom part of the Royals' order was a key to their September success. You look at the numbers when you get seven, eight, nine guys. White, Slot, and Concepcion hitting 271, 264, 282 for the season. That's not too bad. Well, I think if you came in and you were going to scout the Royals, what were you going to do? You're going to pitch to Brett and Balboni, or are you going to pitch to the end of the order? Uh, if you go back to last year's World Series, why did the Orioles do so well? The Three Stooges, as they were called, had a great series. That's right. Dempsey, the MVP. I mean, you're playing percentages. If you want Brett to be here, or, yep. or do you want a guy like Slot? One ball, two strikes to count on Frank White. That was a great team of role players who didn't role play this year. Well, when you usually look at a team as successful as the Orioles were last year, you have almost everybody having career years. The Tigers are no exception. They have a lot of guys that are having outstanding years. Guys they didn't maybe expect to have as good a year as they did. What's a little bit scary, as we talked about last night, Larry Herndon, who they expected 20 home runs and driving 90 runs, didn't have a good year. What happens if he has a good one next year? Yeah. Foul back. And it's two and two. The Tigers, you're right. Sometimes the numbers can be a little deceiving. When you look at all of their numbers together, not thrillingly impressive. Only Trammell hit over 300. Gibson was the only man with more than 20 steals. But as Jim said, some of the guys did have career years. You can make a case almost for Lemon having one. Wilcox, the pitcher, best of his career, and it's been a long one for Milk. As White strikes out on an off-speed pitch. Well, that was a, really the second curveball that Petrie's thrown. Got ahead in the count. And a good curveball. You can see the break. White swings right through it. Well, I realize it's only the middle of the third inning, but we've talked about how hard it is once the Tigers get a lead. Kansas City, if they have any chance, simply must get something going. And Petrie doesn't look as if he's going to give in to any degree. He really seems to have everything tonight. Well, he does, but when you come to Royal Stadium, and as a, a member of the Royals for many years playing here, 
The way Kansas City gets back into the game is by taking the extra base, getting the ball to the opposite field. That's easy to do against a team that doesn't have a lot of foot speed. The Tigers are probably quicker and a better defensive club than the team they're playing, the Royals. So they're going to have to maybe hit a home run from somebody you don't expect one from. 0 oh 1 the count on Don Schlott. So it's a weak ground ball in the second. Whitaker throws him out. Petrie has started the game by retiring eight straight. And Onyx Concepcion comes up as you look at college football, Nebraska, Oklahoma State, Georgia, Alabama are our games. And uh, October 13th, the week from Saturday, Oklahoma against Texas, 3.30 Eastern time, CFA College Football. Last time Onyx Concepcion faced Dan Petrie on August 10th, he was hit by a pitch and broke his hand. Then he got back into the lineup in September and played very well down the stretch. Grounded to short. Trammell throws out Concepcion, and that's three perfect innings for Petrie, and the Tigers are rolling along. At the end of three full, it's Detroit three, Kansas City nothing, game two. Tigers on top, three nothing, as we go to the top of the fourth inning in game two. Big man for Detroit tonight has been Kirk Gibson. First inning with Whitaker on and one out. This double down the right field line made the score one to nothing as Whitaker comes in. And Gibson would subsequently score on Parrish's double. And then in the third inning, he'll just score 2 0 Tigers. Kirk Gibson ripping a pitch from Saber Hagen over the fence in center near the 4 10 marker. And that's where we stand right now. 3 0 with Jones to lead off in the fourth inning. Rupert Jones rounded out in the first. Foul yeah. away. Talking about Jones's background before, went to Berkeley High School in the Bay Area. Played there with Lynn Burke, who was up for a while with the Dodgers, and also in that outfield was Claudel Washington. Now with the Braves. One and two on Jones. Hard pitch. Good running fastball. Rupert Jones, as you said before, Al, great natural ability, but he has a big swing. I actually think he's a better breaking ball hitter than he is a fastball hitter. If you get the ball away or you get it inside, he has trouble catching up. Here's a breaking pitch, and he takes it for called strike three. This gets completely full, can't even pull the trigger. Johnny Grubb, you called him much travel down. Indeed. A number of seasons he got off to a big start. Good enough when he was with San Diego to be named as that team's representative to the All-Star team. San Diego, Cleveland, Texas, and now Detroit. Uh, case of when Grubb first came up, it looked like he would be San Diego's longtime center fielder. Hitting 300, grounding it down to short. And Concepcion throws him out. So two down as Saber Hagen has retired four in a row and six of the last seven. Grubb platooned as the DH. Two of the four that he retired, Parrish and Evans really belted the ball. Yep. Line shots to deep right, you'll remember. That following the home run by Gibson. Mm -hmm. Lemon grounded out in the second inning. One and other count. Stadium, Kansas City, where it's 3 0 Tigers. Whitaker reaching on Concepcion's error. Gibson and Parrish with doubles to make it 2 0. Gibson with a home run in the third inning to make it 3 0. And the Royals have gone down with Nary a Whimper facing Dan Petrie. If they're going to do something, Al, this is the inning. After all, they begin with Wilson. Then they have a seemingly tired Pat Sherry. Tall kid. But trail of thought in, and I think he tired in September. Don't you, Jim? Well, he slumped the entire month. Has a big swing. Kind of a slight body frame, as you said. And you have a big swing, and you're tired. You don't get the bat into the hitting zone. But after Sheridan, we have Brett. Willie Wilson, switch hitter, grounded out in the first inning. 
Wells have hit only one ball out of the infield. That was an easy fly ball by Brett in the first. Well, what Wilson does if he gets on presents the stealing possibility, and he changes the tempo that Petrie's been able to avoid, which is to have to hurry, change his repertoire. You kind of hope when you're facing a guy like Petrie that he's going to be nervous and he's going to throw balls and he's not going to be able to get his pitches over. But he's overmatched him. Totally Why would overmatched. Petrie be nervous. He's won 37 games in two years. 19 last year, 18 this year. Well, the only reason I say you might be nervous is that when you're a pitcher, what causes you to be apprehensive is that every time you go out to the mound, you don't know how you're going to be. You don't know if you're going to have good stuff. You don't know like if you're going to have. Like a fighter going into the ring. How will it be? Well, I've I never fought, <laughs> but I have pitched, and I know that you just don't know what you're going to have. One two delivery is ripped on a line, but caught by Evans at first base. So the best hit ball of the night turns into the 10th consecutive out. It's the way it goes, the boys in Chicago are saying today everything's going the Cubbies' way. It's one of those balls. It's a sure double, possibly a triple if it gets to the wall, the way Wilson can run. But he's sitting in the dugout right now. One out here in the fourth. Pat Sheridan is the batter. He grounded out in the first inning, and he's over three in the two nights. Ball one. He's been consistently clocking Petrie in the low to mid-90 range tonight. Two balls, no strikes to count. Probably ball three. Especially down three nothing, trying to get somebody on base. Well, there's a fine line though, Al. If, you, if you're managing, you don't want your club not to be aggressive. Then again, when you talk about Pat Sharon, you're not talking about a guy that has a lot of experience. If you make that pitch to a guy that's been around a few years, and as I said last night, when Brett's hitting well, he doesn't swing at that pitch. When he's in a slump or he's struggling, he does. Next pitch is fouled back in the count three and two. If I'm hitting in front of George Brett, I want to get on. So maybe two and oh. Yeah. You've been around a few years. You take that pitch and it's three and oh, or at least maybe you let the umpire help you out a little bit. And he works his way aboard. So Sheridan draws the walk, and the Royals finally have something to get excited about. At least the fans do. As they come to life on ball four to Sheridan. First base runner for KC. Brett, 0 for 4 last night, 0 for 1 tonight. You mentioned before two homers of Petrie this season, three in his career. If past his prologue, this is the spot. interpret that 500 average that Petrie doesn't make very many good pitches to Brett. He's probably getting the ball in the middle of the plate and when you do that to a guy like George, he's going to ball hit the ball not only hard but sometimes a long distance. Sheridan at first base. One open. It's ripped to right center field in for a base hit. First with a single as Sheridan goes to third. For a walk and a base hit. What a beautiful swing. I just love to watch Brett in slow motion. One of the sweet swingers in all of baseball. This is how you hit 390 one year. Hit the ball where it's pitched. <laughs> Petrie got a fastball in the middle of the plate, and he just ripped it into right center field. A lot of class in that kid, too. A walk and a single, and all of a sudden, the Royals are trying to get back in it as they trail 3-0, and Orr to the batter, grounded out in the second inning. 
Tiger infield. Back double play depth. They lead 3 nothing, so that's the obvious alignment in this situation. During the regular season, nine home runs, 50 runs batted in. One and one. If he gets a hit, you'll see the wave. Just think if Willie Wilson would have gotten a hit. Evans able to glove the line drive, otherwise Petrie would have been in major trouble right now. As it is, he's still able to get out of the inning on a ground ball. One and two the count. Sheridan is at third. Brett is at first. Well, to me, when a lot of balls start getting hit hard, that's a pretty good indication that either you're losing stuff and the radar gun tells us that he isn't because he's still throwing 93 or 94 miles per hour, but it does indicate that he's getting the ball in the middle of the plate, not making the same pitches he made in the first three innings. If that continues, he's going to be in trouble. Count even now. Two balls, two strikes on George Orta. A lot of pitchers, when they have a 3 0 lead, they just say, okay, first and third, I'll give up this one run. I don't want any big innings. But you don't really know what Dan Petrie's thinking. He's trying to make the perfect pitch and ends up walking Orta. Well, Orta yeah. has a record, as you just saw in the graphic, of hitting Petrie fairly well. Two two delivery lifted foul and it will wind back out of play swing at a bad pitch chased it. Well it's when, once you get the two strikes hard in this situation you're trying to protect the page and when a guy's throwing his good fastball at 93 or 94 you really don't have a chance you want to get that bat started the worst thing that can happen here if he hits the ground ball the left side. You're probably not going to get a double play and you're going to get a run in. So he doesn't want to strike out. But if he does strike out, you don't score and you don't get back into the game. Two balls, two strikes. Ground ball toward Whitaker. Steps on second. One to first, not in time. So Ord is able to leg it out as Sheridan scores. And on the fourth and second, the Royals get a run to make it three to one. Pretty good piece of hitting. There you see that fastball running away. He just pounds it into the dirt. And now it's a foot race. There you see he just beats it by about a step. Well, he first. Butcher, he butcher boy a bad pitch again into the ground. And Whitaker had a bit of a break on Astro turf. That ball could have bounded over his head. Here is Motley. Unintentionally fouling it at the plate. No balls and one strike to count. Orta with no steals. In fact, the Royals have a few guys without any steals. Orta, Balboni, Slot, and Brett. Those are four everyday players. And Hal McRae, who with Orta is the platoon D8. None of those men stole a base during the regular season. Center field as Orta pulls in its second. So in the inning, the line drive out and a walk, single, a horse play to score a run, and a line single here. A Balboni home run that draws this place to a rough. Right now, I mentioned that the Royals had gone down without a whipper in the first three innings. Nothing even remotely resembles a hit. And here in the fourth inning, second time around through the order, as Balboni comes up, and look for him has been a propitious position this season. One is in scoring position, two out. 
been a different story facing Petrie the second time through the order. Well, again, he's not making good pitches. I always felt this is the type of guy I'd like to have come up in this situation because he's an easy guy to strike out. 139 on the year certainly indicates that. Got jammed and hits a foul back out of play. Another thing he does as far as helping out a pitcher that he swings a lot of bad pitches. He just did. He's going to help you out. I mean, he's not the type of guy that's going up there to walk. As we said earlier, Dick Hauser doesn't want that. You put a Steve Balboni's name down the lineup. You think of Earl Weaver. You think of the three-run home run. <laughs> Balboni with 28 home runs during the regular year. Two on with two out. Didn't help out that time as he laid off the pitcher inside and it's one and one. Have a look at a man who had 10 of his 28 home runs here. 18 on the road. He gets a pitch, he can, they can hit it anyway. Ball park, not an issue with him. One and two. slider as I said he can strike out Petri made one of the few good pitches he made that inning for, for the strikeout three to one Tigers Hauser on the left Anderson on the right <laughs> well the master of classic literature Lawrence Vera don't forget Monday night football 49ers unbeaten Joe Montana again hitting his pet White Clark against the Giants who began swimmingly. Three victories and came a cropper against the Redskins and against the Rams, but with the capacity to strike back. Fifth inning is Tommy Brookins leads off with a fly ball to right field on his first at bat. He's inserted into Bergman's spot in the order with Dave going out with the hamstring pull. One pitch and one out, and Saberhagen has retired six in a row and eight of the last nine after a shaky start as Whitaker comes up. And that's what's given this team a lift. Saberhagen pitching now the way Hauser had hoped he'd pitch from the very start of the game. Increasing confidence. You can see it in it. Just the way Palmer was when he faced Yao. The final game of the 82 season. And Yao hit him for consecutive home runs. Oh, what a... What an afternoon. And you were there. Uh, yeah. No balls, two strikes to count. So never let me forget about it. I've seen a lot of home run balls that you <laughs> Dick Howes, the Royals manager, may have been his last home run in the big leagues. Would you believe? May have been his first, too. His <laughs> first and last. <laughs> and he was bailing out. There are the ages. Joe Bush back in 1913 for the Giants. Did you have lunch with him today? <laughs> In 1913, I think. <laughs> Took something off, and he's got a good change, and Whitaker strikes out. He was out this in front. Kid, this kid's giving him a big lift now. Twice he's gotten Whitaker on strikes. Same pitch, too. Got ahead of him. Threw him a curveball last time, and he swung right through it. Here we see the slow-mo from behind home plate. Part of pitching is changing speeds. You can just see the bat go right over that curveball. Allen Travel. Want to know the count? Perfect night last night, but tonight he's 0 for 2, flying to center and grounded to first. Two out of the base is empty. Where was that one? 
It was 93 miles an hour. And Kidd is really winging it now. To the crowd, it appeared to be a strike, but not to Bill Deegan. That's in there. Just about the same spot, too. Two and one. You know, we talked about his youth and also about his self-possession. I think he's holding together very well in terms of his composure. Well, that he is, and I don't think he'd be pitching here, as Dick Hauser said, if he did not have that poise. He throws strikes. You don't see many young pitchers that come up and can throw strikes. That's the hardest thing a young pitcher with a good arm has to learn. I think of Wally Bunker back in 64. I think of Storm Davis with the Orioles. Not too many guys can throw a lot of strikes. Looped into right field for a base hit. Trammell takes the wide turn and then falls down. Trammell was thinking about going to second, perhaps. But that ended in a hurry as he hit the bag and went down. He was thinking, all right, he was going if this mishap hadn't occurred. However, Allen has his first hit of the evening. And hit number five off Saberhagen as Gibson comes to the plate. With a double and a home run, he has scored twice, driven in two, and he is four for seven in the championship series. Tigers three, Royals one. Two out, top of the fifth inning. Trammell at first base. We talked about his poise and his maturity. He's thrown Gibson two fastballs out over the plate. One went down the right field corner for a double. One went over the center field fence. Let's see if he has the maturity, because part of maturity is being able to adjust. And let's see if he pitched Gibson a little bit different here. Nobody's pitched. Trammell had 19 steals this season. He was also caught 13 times. You say nobody was perfect. That's what I, I said. I wasn't sure that you were aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> He's not. <laughs> nobody likes a wise. <laughs> I do. <laughs> You're right, James. <laughs> that ball gets by Balboni, and down a second goes Trammell. Trammell hobbling after he made that turn and went down, and Trammell, who's been bothered with shoulder problems and last year elbow problems now he's waving the trainer off saying he's okay hit him, well, hit him right, hit him right on the thigh. thigh that's what's bothering well I said Balboni last night was good on the balls in the dirt he's just not too good on the ones waist high <laughs> there he just reaches for the ball it's kind of into the runner and Trammell is it Maybe that's the way to get him Second. out, out of the game. <laughs> Up high. One ball, no strikes on Gibson. First base open here. Well, pitch carefully to him. Right. We're going to pitch around the guy that's uh, only hit 28 home runs to pitch to the guy that's got 34. 33 yeah. home runs. 30, well, with it, counting last night, 34. <laughs> it's 90. one of those gambles because of the percentage of lefty righty. The season. But... I think it's only fair to point out as we see a fastball on the inside good pitch kind of pitch you have to make when you get behind Kirk Gibson. If you lose that gamble the score is going to be six to one. <laughs> one one pitch. Don't forget it's a three run home run for Earl. Well Earl would be happy but. But there are points in ball games where you have to make that gamble. I don't really think the way this game is going even though the Royals did show some interest in getting back in the game that he can afford to give up another run three balls and one strike the count three runs five hits and no errors for the Tigers one run two hits and two errors for the Royals top of the fifth inning off day again tomorrow in the American League Championship Series while the Cubs in San Diego resume action out west you going to Detroit <laughs> am I invited <laughs> Palmer and I don't want you on the plane <laughs> Three and two. Speak for yourself now. Okay, I'll speak for Kurt Gowdy. He told me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the old cowboy. He said he didn't mind the jockocracy, but he doesn't like the other professional right <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're acting up. Oh, yes. Well, you know, I we know Kurt roots for the Red Sox, and I threw all those home runs in, up in Fenway. He's always loved me. The old cowboy. Doing the games on radio, along with Bill White, 
as Gibson takes ball four. So Kirk draws the walk, gets aboard for the third time tonight, and up comes Parrish, who has doubled and fly to right. You were right about it. We could put an asterisk by that walk. That was a semi-intentional walk. It certainly was. But it's a gamble, and uh, we'll just kind of wait and see what happens. Lance Parrish led the Tigers in home runs the last five seasons. Something last accomplished by Harry Heilman in Detroit in the early 20s. It was looking great. Then, as so often happens, blue pit into right field by Trammell. The walk and trouble. One. Yeah, nope. Aaron Pickoff. At it. Breaking ball. That just misses. That might have been a bad call. Yeah. And a couple of questionable ones in the inning. But you have them when the great pros are here, too. You better believe it. I think the uh, umpire in Chicago made a pretty good point in the paper this morning where he said if he only missed three pitches, which is what he felt, he had a pretty good pretty good day or night. If you miss over seven, you had a bad one. One ball and two strikes to count now on Parrish. Even in your career, there were occasions when umpires became a nettlesome factor. Oh, I love them not too often. <laughs> I'm kind of like Earl. Once you get up in a booth, you love all the umpires. One two pitch outside. So two and two now with two men out and two men on. And the Tigers on top by two. Trammell is at second. Gibson, outstanding speed at first. Obviously, the crisis point right now for the Royals in this game. Very big pitcher. What Detroit runs. Foul away. What Detroit runs. And be curious. Where's Hernandez? Have you spoken to him? <laughs> he doesn't go out to the bullpen until the seventh inning. That's correct. Something that uh, when I first started with the Orioles, Stu Miller used to lie in the clubhouse until about the sixth. And he strikes him out. Good fastball. Nice bit of clutch pitching by 20 year old Brett Saberhagen. And got him and in the inning, no runs, one hit, one error, and two men left on. After four and a half, Detroit still leading Kansas City three to one. Kansas City against Detroit, Tiger Stadium. First postseason action there since 1972. Charlie Liebrandt on the mound for Kansas City and Milt Wilcox off his finest year, 17 and 8, working for Detroit. Will be on the air at 8 o'clock Eastern time. What a cute kid. Cute guy. That's George Toma holding that. Baby, the, the nation's ground leading groundskeeper. groundskeeper, the man who drove Catfish Hunter wild. I he love it. Doctor the mound, and Catfish would always say to me, "I don't know what he's doing now, but somehow it doesn't feel right." He went out. <laughs> the nation's leading groundskeeper, and all he has to work with is artificial turf here. Let me tell you, came out to the Olympics, worked over the Rose Bowl. Here's Frank White fouling it away. And the International Federation soccer people said it was the second best soccer field in the world. And this after it worked on it for only a couple of weeks. Well, it brought Tom out to do the manicuring for some Super Bowls. He's terrific. He is. Takes care of Arrowhead Stadium, which is right behind us, the two stadiums side by side here in the Truman Sports Complex. White lost it toward shallow right but Whitaker is there as one second baseman takes care of the other for the first out in the bottom of the fifth inning. Hauser says he's got nothing to do here that basically is just a painter <laughs> painting <laughs> the walls. Well you know they they're going to lay down a new artificial surface here next year. This is the original. They had surface. talked about putting going back to right. natural grass which would have been great. Well a couple of factors uh, figured in it would have been more expensive they tell me to put the grass back in that's a fact it rains a, a lot million eight. it costs you some rain outs right and also um, in talking to some of the Royals people they have felt that they've drafted players contingent upon playing on an astroturf surface or an artificial surf or, or artificial surface and as a consequence the uh, that's one of the reasons that also 
came to bear when they decided to go with the artificial turf next year as opposed to grass. Ground ball to the right side. Two down. Did you play on natural turf or was it an artificial surface? Where? At the intersection of the Santa Monica Freeway exit and Robertson <laughs> Boulevard. Well, oh, at Hamilton? Yes. Pure grass. Now, what about, you went to Hamilton High School in Brooklyn. In the Brooklyn. corner of what, Albany Avenue and uh, Avenue D? Albany Avenue and Bergen Street. They closed it down. <laughs> it's closed. <laughs> Do you have a brick or two from that high school? Or something no, that Mark Breland, our Olympic gold medal winner in the Wellaweight classification, went there for a time, and he probably has a brick. It was still open when he was there, but he's still a youngster with a possibly brilliant career before him. Onyx Concepcion at the plate. One ball and one strike to count. Again, mentioned it last night. No relation to David of the Reds. Been backing up UL Washington here for a couple of years, but as of now, he is the shortstop. Even though Dick Hauser, because of injuries, had to shuffle six different guys in there, including Bucky oh, Dent this season. Down to the third, it's a fair ball, and then the throw gets by Evans, and down to second base goes Concepcion. Crowd is booing, but with the ball in front of the bag, until the ball reaches third, the call is the home plate umpire's call, unless Deegan, even though he was further from the play, is the man who makes this call. So Deegan calls it fair as Brookins throws the ball away. And the Royals with a man at second and two down. Probably the toughest play a third baseman has to make in baseball. Of course, if he came up with the Orioles and you watch Brooks Robinson, you certainly wouldn't think that. The master of that play. Matter is Willie Wilson will get the scoring in a moment. A five, one and oh. A hit now, and we've got the scrappy Kansas City Ball Club that took over in the latter part of the season. Well, a hit now is, if it's a single, it's just like throwing a double. Because Wilson will steal second, and he'll be in a tie game situation. Brookins charged with an error all the way, and the pitch is up and away. 2-0 and on Willie Wilson. Willie drew a career-high 39 walks this season. He's not your prototypical leadoff man, even though he's a good one, in the sense that he doesn't walk very much. Was it a couple of years ago, somebody said to Willie, why don't you walk more than you do? You're leading off. Said I wanted to walk. I'd have been a mailman. Okay. Well, let's see if he takes a walk here, Al. Two and one. Trying to get Alfalfa off the hook. <laughs> Good speed, second base. And Petrie on top three to one. And it's two balls and two strikes now. I wouldn't be surprised if they stay with that fastball. Last time Willie was up, he hit the line drive that Evans speared down the first baseline. On a slider, when you throw that slider, it's not quite as quick as that fastball. Get the bat out a little bit. If you remember the 1980 World Series, what Wilson struck out, what, 11? 12 times. 12 times, and yeah. they just ran the ball up and in on him. Had a very bad series. Let's see if they go back up and in. Strike three on the inside corner, and Willie is furious. Well, he's furious, Al, but that was a good pitch. I think the instant replay we'll probably see will show that. I think you're exactly right, and that's the easy thing to do. Watch this. What happened? Inside corner. Well, you talked Just about that above the knee. moving fastball went right back over the plate. Three to one. We'll be back after this from your local stations. Evans, Jones, Grubb, 
will come up as we go to the sixth inning. Here it was today in Chicago where the Cubs won game one, 13 nothing. They came back, won game two, 4 2. Trout and Smith combining for the victory. And they're moving west as we speak. Tomorrow night, game three, Cubs against San Diego. Chicago, one victory away from wrapping it up. Meanwhile, the Tigers, with a win in hand, lead here 3-1. Evans fly to left and fly to right. Two for six in the series thus far. Brent Saberhagen. Got to keep them this close. Can't give up another run. It's that simple. The crowd is all over Bill Deegan, the plate up They booed him. That's such an easy thing to do. Yeah. One would think they were positioned to see the pitch, make a judgment. Foul down the right field line, and the count is one and one. Cookie Rojas, for many years, one of the fine infielders that Kansas City had. Very versatile ball player. <laughs> Love the high fastball. That's right. Originally a Branch Rickey discovery. Beck does radio, I think, for the California Angels on their Spanish uh, broadcasting network. He's the coach here. He was a coach on several of the Western Division Championship clubs. Fly ball to right field. And for the third time tonight, Evans has flied out as Sheridan puts this one away. One away. Another look at the pitch to Wilson. Very little doubt as the crowd, crowd's really on Deegan. They were on him the entire time during the changeover. Strike in anybody's book, though, right there. But a reaction like that will always incite the fans. There's little doubt about that. Not that many people sit back at the plate from... The upper deck down the right field line <laughs> where Euchre normally sits. <laughs> it's a little difficult to see where that pitch was. Strike to Jones. Euchre was very touched when Milwaukee gave him that permanent chat. You, you heard about that. Yes. yes. We discussed it, didn't we, last night? There, there. <laughs> but he missed the tag somewhere in that area. <laughs> Oh, and through the count. Bob's a red hot personality these days, and I love it. He deserves it. Great person. Oh, Spent the terrific. weekend with him at Malibu. A lot of fun. Malibu? Only thing we. Uh, what are you, sight dropping now, or huh? what? Yep. I could. Still Owen. What were you doing in Malibu? I was uh, using Euchre as my commissioner in the Battle of the Network Stars. Oh, yeah. Sports writer once called it trash sports, thus giving sacred nature to uh, falsified transcripts, Mickey Mouse courses, and under the table payments. <laughs> College football. <laughs> Big time. 0 2 pitch. Shatters his bat. It's a fly full to center field. Two down. Howard, I just wish you were a little bit more opinionated. <laughs> What'd you say? There's Charlie Lee Brand in the Kansas City dugout. He'll be the pitcher on Friday. Team one pitcher chart. right next to him, Bud Black, keeping the chart. Bud saying, leaning over, saying, don't throw the ball in the middle of the plate to trammel or perish. Johnny Grubb takes a strike, and the count is 0-1. Key here is, for the hope of a royal resurgence, this kid is keeping them in the game. He's doing exactly what he's supposed to do. Be a play or two early in the ball game, it might be a little bit closer, but he certainly not letting the game get out of hand, and that's what you want to do as a starting pitcher. Keep it under control. High fly ball to right field, deep but playable, and back goes Sheridan making the catch. And so Saberhagen has done the job here in the sixth inning. Certainly seven. has. Tigers are gone in order. Royals coming up. It'll be Sheridan, Brett, and Orta in the bottom of the six. Three to one, Detroit. <laughs> stretch because of that torn hamstring and he talks about his current physical condition 
I don't think I'm going to be 100 percent until about three weeks after baseball season. Hopefully that's the middle of November. Uh, I came back a little too soon. I started pinch hitting a couple times, and I think every time I pinch hit during the regular season, I aggravate a little bit, and it never really gave it a chance to, to uh, heal. And then I started playing. I played about the last three weeks of the season. And um, uh, as long as I still try to run and still try to move a little bit, uh, every once in a while I sting it or I, I just injure it a little bit more. But uh, when it comes time for the playoffs, I think I'll be feeling a lot better tomorrow night than I than I did last week. Uh, I'll probably be able to run a little bit faster. Hopefully I'll be have a little more range at third base. And uh, just hopefully I'll be able to go out and contribute a little bit more than I did this season because I really didn't carry my weight at all. Brett talking on Monday about the then upcoming championship series. He is up second in the inning as we go to the bottom of the sixth. Pretty key inning here for Kansas City. Down by two because if Petrie gets out of this one, you're thinking about Hernandez and company. I say in company because they also have Aurelio Lopez as well. As Sparky's got to go to the pen, and the Royals have the two, three, and four hitters here. Kind of getting in a feeling about the Royals tonight, don't you, Jim? The way Sabahagan has kept them in the game. Well, he's given the opportunity that if they want to get back in the game, they can do it. It's really up to them. And Mr. Petrie right here. One ball, one strike to count on Sheridan, who has grounded out and walked. Good fastball on the count is one and two. There's Saber Hagen. Twenty years, five months. What a wonderful time of life. To left field. And it's Jones moving over and making the catch as he comes toward the line to take care of Sheridan for the first out. So now Brett will come up with the bases empty. One out in the sixth inning. Brett is fly to center and single. Tell the truth. Do you really want to pitch again, Jim? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Stop hedging. Come back in this ballpark, you can win 30, 25, certainly. <laughs> I couldn't win 30 when I had all my abilities. <laughs> one and one. You know Jim's not coming back, Howard. He's huh? a full-fledged member of the jockocracy right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mark, Mark Gubaza. Gubaza on the left. And Larry Gura. And Larry Gura on the right. Gubaza is uh, scheduled to pitch in a fourth game if there is a fourth game. So those guys are just down there getting in some work. Grounded to second. Whitaker throws Brett out for the second out. Gura has kind of been one of the forgotten men. Gura started the season in the rotation and pitched only once in the last four weeks of the year. Talked about it last night with the Royals as you look at Larry in the bullpen. Tremendous transition. Dennis Leonard has missed all of this year and most of last with injuries. Paul Splitoff retired. Vita Blue was released. Gura is now out of the rotation. Complete revampment. I was talking to John Sherholtz about Dennis Leonard. They still have fond hopes that he'll come back next year. Probably not until maybe May or June. Gorda slapping it foul. Certainly one of the dominant pitchers in the American League when he's healthy. Like he was pitching against Baltimore when he tore that tendon, I think, in his left knee. Had it repaired, got an infection in it. With his talent, you'd like to see that guy you know, back in baseball. Nice man. 0-1 pitch. Is a strike on the outside corner, and the count is on two. <laughs> Petrie. Well, I said last night that Deegan was a pitcher's umpire, and he's given him maybe a little bit more off the corner than you'd like to have if you're a hitter. But it's not something that the hitters don't know about. I mean, they saw it last night. They know the strike zone is going to be up, and they know that they better swing the bat with two strikes. 
I mean, let's face it, even with the professional umpires, there are hitters umpires and there's pitchers umpires. Two and two. Uh, let's put an end to this. Nobody pretends that the substitute umpires equate with the major league umpires whose whole life it is. Nobody. This is a business like any other. There is labor strife as in any business. It's the way it is. Ground ball to the right side. And that's that as Whitaker throws him out. So the two, three, and four hitters go down in order. On to the seventh we go with the Tigers leading the Royals three to one in game two. Things off after a fine season. Lemon at Detroit was asked by Howard the other day if he's ever played for a better team than the 84 Tigers. Not really, Howard. I think last year we had a great ball club, and I think that we played well enough to win our division. But uh, Baltimore played great baseball last year, and they were the world champions. But this year, with the acquisition of Daryl Evans and Willie Hernandez, I think we strengthened our ball club even more. And for a certainty, I have to say that this is the most complete ball club that I've ever played on. And they gel real well as a ball club, as a team, and we just go out every day and we bear down and do the very best that we can. Win, lose, or draw, the guys come off the field, and the next day you would never know whether we won 10 in a row or if we lost a couple in a row. So I think that for a certainty, with attitude and, and personnel, this has to be the best ball club I've ever been on. Pretty well stated. Mm -hmm. Lemon 0 for 2 tonight. Tigers on top 3 1 seventh inning. One ball and one strike to count. Lemon, then Brookins, and then the top of the order, Whitaker in the seventh. Who's that? Doug Barron, the Tiger bullpen? Time to send Hernandez out there. Basically, based upon the history of this season, Kansas City has really only three outs left. If they put Hernandez in. One and two, the count. Tigers with two in the first and one in the third, and the Royals got their run in the bottom of the fourth. What's your prediction for this game, Jim? Kansas City. <laughs> but since the Tigers are 87 and 0 going in the ninth with a lead, they better do it before then. <laughs> it's 88 now. Now, yes. Half swing, bouncer to third. It's Brett ranging to his left and throwing out Lemon. One gone here in the top of the seventh inning, and we'll take a look at Tommy Brookins. Tigers have really never settled their third base spot all season long, but it hasn't hurt. Brookins has been there. Sparky contends that Howard Johnson is his guy for next season. He had Marty Castillo starting there last night. He had Evans starting there tonight. But you kind of get the feeling, though, the reason that uh, Johnson's not playing is maybe he's not as good with the glove as Castillo or Evans. I mean, he certainly didn't have a bad year hitting. No. Uh, other than that, I can't think of any other reason. Sparky said the other day one of the reasons that Johnson would not start in the series, and there's Anderson. It was a little young, is the way he put it, which I think is a euphemistic way of saying that it's a pressure situation, and he'd like to go with maybe people with more experience, even though Castillo doesn't necessarily. Well, Johnson that did him some service in the early going this season. You'll remember. Yep. There's an unwritten story here, and it's that kid on the mound for the Royals. Ball for That's strike. what I mean. Right there. That's number five. He has kept Saberhagen. his team in the game. He has never lost his composure. And there is somehow a sense in this crowd of possible resurgence by Kansas City. That's really, despite all our kidding around, what Jim meant when he said Kansas City. Because along about the fourth inning, he said to me, I think Kansas City's going to win this game. It sharply and White went the wrong way. He read it wrong when the ball left the bat. Frank was going to his right, and the ball was in a little bit behind him. Hit very sharply into right center field. So Whitaker is on as we we have him isolated. The shortstop. Alan well, a lot of times now the ball will hook back. One of those balls that Frank White should have had and normally does. You don't win six Golden Gloves in the American League if you don't make that play. But the turf is a strange. Character and uh, that's one of the reasons I think Kansas City has a chance if Saber Hagen can keep him in the game and he's done that. And he's done that. It's a big ballpark. You get a, a lot of bad job hops. and he deserves all the kudos in the world. Comes as advertised by Dick Hauser. Two out. 
Seventh inning. Trammell hits it in the air to left field, but right to Motley. No runs, one hit, and a man left on, and Motley will be leading off when we come up in the bottom of the seventh inning. The Royals trailing the Tigers three to one. Dancing Waters of Royal Stadium in Kansas City, Missouri. As we go to the bottom of the seventh inning, Dan Petrick pitching beautifully through six has allowed one run, two hits, both hits in the fourth inning. One of them off the bat of this man, Motley, who popped out in the second and singled in the fourth. Motley one for six in the series. Three to one lead. This is the time of the game, and to amplify what you said about the excellence of the Tiger bullpen, when you're a starting pitcher, you start counting the outs. You need nine outs, maybe only three by you. That's an interesting graphic. Now, who's just joined the Bear in the bullpen? It looks to me that we have both Bears sitting down and Lopez and, and Hernandez is up. Broken bat bouncer, one hop, Brookins has it. Put out recorded at first. That's Lopez on the left, and that's actually Bill Scherer, the left-hander on correct. the right. That's Aurelio Lopez, which is the point. And there's Scherer, the rail thin left-hander acquired from Cincinnati in August. Just prior to the eligibility date. Mr. Anderson plays to win. Period. Sure acquired the eligibility date. September 1st. If you're not on the roster by then, unless you can get special dispensation, you're normally not eligible for postseason play. Ripped to the left by Balboni for a base hit. Jones cutting it off, and Balboni has Kansas City's third hit of the night with one out in the seventh inning. And so the Royals. We'll get the tying run to the plate in the person of Frank White, who had 17 homers this year. Had he uh, gotten that hit his last turn at bat, but he was pitched quite differently then. Well, you do pitch quite differently when you have to get out of a jam. There, I think Petrie may have relaxed a little bit, threw him a fastball right in the middle of the plate. He hit that ball just about as hard as you could hit it on the line. One out. Slow runner Balboni at first base. So slow, in fact, and with the situation the way it is, Evans can afford to play behind him. One and all. Well, you made the point, Al. He's capable of a home run. Gladys happens to be a very, very lovely lady. Amazed at her husband's prowess this year, she said, I never thought it hit 17 in one season. He can hit it along the foul line now. Make it 18, then your prognostication will come true, Jim. Well, that'll only tie it up. We still don't have to worry about getting a winning run. Well, if Frank White can hit those home runs. As you said, he had 17, but it's going to usually be on a hanging slider. That's grounded down to third. Brookins goes to Whitaker, one to first, not in time there. Throw a little bit high at second. And Whitaker slightly out of sync and trying to turn it over. White still runs fairly well, and Frank is frustrated with his effort here, but he keeps the inning alive anyway. Well, he down. got the slider, but it wasn't hanging. Brookins, of course, is thinking, as most third basemen in this situation, you'd like to have a double play, but you want to get the sure out. And Whitaker, of course, doesn't want to throw it away. He makes a good effort, but White's got pretty good speed. Two down. Slot is the batter. Grounded out twice. Slot two hits last night, two for five in the series now. Three to one Tigers. One and oh the count. This is one tough team to beat. This is a, at about the point where somebody should start, start discussing whether or not you'd have White try to steal or stir something up. Well, 
Well, Frank can run fast, but he's not a good base runner, so I don't think I wouldn't advise that. Not the way Parrish can throw runners out. Best way above in the, the league, the yep. best. One ball and one strike, and Petrie is very tough to steal on. 23 men have tried to steal a base against Petrie this season. Only nine have been successful. Of course, that's Petrie and normally Parrish who does the catching. Steal more than one base against Petrie this year was Willie Wilson. <laughs> Sliced foul, and the count is one ball and two strikes. Three runs, six hits, and one error for the Tigers. One run, three hits, and two errors for the Royals. A little bit more than. 40,000 in capacity at Royal Stadium in Kansas City, site of the American League Championship Series now for the fifth time in the last nine seasons. Still think this is the prettiest ballpark in the country. Gorgeous. I love it. This is in Dodger Stadium. It's a great yeah. sports yeah. complex. Dodger Stadium, I think, is the best run ballpark in the country. Still gorgeous, too, though, the way it's set in Chavez Ravine. Still can't get over those Olympic crowds for baseball. Just incredible. I thought you'd come over. I was in the booth every day. I thought you'd come over and visit. But you were doing boxing. One, two pitch. Broken back. Soft one hopper to travel. And he doesn't make the play at second base. He made a mistake of judgment. Quite clearly something you don't and see Trammell go. Should have thrown the ball to first period. Immediately well, upon gathering it in. Ball hit so softly, uh, it, I think he had trouble reading it off the bat, too. It looked like he could have made the catch on the fly. Major mistake of judgment, and so a life for the Royals. And that is Orge who came over from the Cardinals. They purchased Dane in May. He'd been at St. Louis. Played on the Cardinals championship team in 1982. His brother Garth, the platooning third baseman for Toronto. Never mind that average you just saw. This kid can hit. He's a good contact hitter. Certainly has got a big hit against the Angels down the stretch to win that extra inning game. Six to five off Don Ossie. Scored as a fielder's choice. Slot breaking his back. Trammell just for a moment. It is. A, it, you're right, Al. It is a, really not much excuse because even when you, you when you see the ball, and it is a tough play to read off the bat because you don't know if it's hit off the end or the fist. You don't know if it's right. hit that hard. But if he does catch it in one hop and make the throw to first, he probably easily. Major mistake slot. of judgment. As I said, you don't often see Alan Trammell do that. In fact, I've never seen him do that before. But he did it. That just gives Kansas City a little bit of life. We saw it earlier. They didn't come up with anything. Let's see if they can do it now. One ball, no strikes. The count here on Ori. Here's the Cowser still in quest of that elusive first postseason win. White at second, and Swan at first. 1-0 pitch to Orange. 2-0 now. Frank White, there's the tying run, Swan. We saw one of the advantages of being a line drive hitter. You can wait a little bit longer when you're yeah, but this guy knows the strike zone, as you well know, Jim. Exactly. Lodge knows the strike zone. This is a confident hitter. Two offense. Line through the glove of Whitaker and out into right field as White comes in to score. Swatch stops at second, and that makes it three to two. Orge hitting a one-hopper that just eats Whitaker up. 
Nothing Lou could do with that ball. Nothing. So Orange with but they score a base hit and a run batted in. Buddy Biancalana goes in to run for Orange, who gets a standing goal as he departs, and Willie Wilson comes up with a tying run at second. Now base. we've got a ball game, and it's a rare day in April, May, June, July, August, or September, or October when you see a team struggle back against these Detroit Tigers in the year of 84. But that Kansas City Royals are in the process of doing. The pinch runner at first base has already been discussed with you. There's the tying run. Right now, Dan Kalana. Wilson, the batter, goes after the first pitch and pops it in the air to left field where Jones will end the inning. Don't you wonder about going at the first pitch in a situation like that, Jim? Well, it's just one of the, he's an aggressive hitter. Thought he had a good pitch and popped it up. Well, well, he does it a lot. We played 7 3 2 back after this from your local station. Bianca Lana, who went into pinch run for Orange Days in the game at shortstop. Kirk Gibson will lead things off with the Tigers, who are on top 3 2 here in the top of the eighth inning. And it's been a big night for Gibson as we go back to the third inning. He had doubled to drive in a run in the first. And then this. And this swing here is now the difference in this game. That was the third Tiger run, and with the score 3 to 2. Gibson has doubled, homered, walked, driven in two runs, and scored a pair tonight. All right, Saber Hagen's job remains what it's been and what he's done so nobly, and now he's got Gibson on an easy pop to short. Leon Galana right there, waiting for it, and makes the play. First time they've gotten Gibson tonight. Kirk is now four for eight in the series, and Parrish is the batter. This kid has done everything that Dick Houser asked of him, could have asked of him. He has pitched an outstanding game against a really outstanding baseball team. It's the other side of the story tonight. And in the meantime, one would be very surprised if Petrie returns to the mound for the eighth with the action in the bullpen. Round the Detroit foul. bullpen. Oh, and one the count. Fortunately, in this ballpark, that's Hernandez there. There is Fernandez, Fernandez. Now in the bullpen. And Lopez. And Aurelio Lopez. What a pair. Well, that's Baron Gare actually on the right. It was it Baron Gare? Baron Lo Lopez was up before, and Baron Gare, who was the fourth starter this season, there is one. Also throwing in the pen. Oh, then I think he's just getting work. He is not scheduled to pitch in any of the games in the series. Anderson's going to go with three. Ground ball. Brett stays with it. After backhanding and throws Parrish out. Nice play by George. Was ball skipping through the sliding box. And Brett knocking it down and throwing him out. So two away. One of those plays, if you don't make it, it's a double. George playing deep, which you can do because Parrish doesn't bunt. You just can't believe how hard the ball can skip on AstroTurf. He knocks it down, has an excellent strong arm, and you'll see it right here. Picks it up, knows that Parrish is not very fast. And strong, accurate throw over to first for the out. Two out, base is empty, and Evans the batter. He's hit the ball in the air three times tonight. Once to left, twice to right, and he's over three. In the air again to right field. And deep, but back goes Sheridan, circling, and on the track makes the catch. So a fourth fly out for Darrell Evans tonight. Nice job by Saberhagen. Really nice. Through the middle innings. He has kept them very much in the game. Three up and three down. Up come the Royals with Detroit on top, three to two. Time for the Tigers. They have the lead late innings, and in comes Willie Hernandez. His regular season numbers are reflected there. 32 saves in 33 possible save situations. In other words, every time he came in outside of one with a possible save imminent, he was able to do the job with Nightline coming up. FBI agent situation and Soviet intrigue. The subjects to be covered by Ted Koppel tonight on Nightline immediately following your late local news. The only time 
Hernandez did not pick up a save, and a save situation was last Friday in a meaningless game in New York when he came in, runners at first and third for the Yankees and one out late in the ball game. And he gave up a sacrifice fly, retired another man, so it wasn't as if he got bombed or anything. He just didn't pick up the save because the run scored to tie the game. Well, Sparky shows you one thing here. He shows you he doesn't feel that Willie is overworked in any sense. He was so quick and brilliant last night. He feels he can come right back and do it tonight. And yeah. let's see if he can. Lynn Jones is the batter. He will hit for Sheridan. He faced Hernandez last night and flied out. And looks at a strike. Despite the career record of Jim Palmer, everyone is human. So maybe Hernandez will prove to be. So he hasn't been human all year. I doubt that he will be tonight. Line drive, base hit in the oh, right field. And maybe more as Gibson plays it near the line. And Jones takes a wide turn and holds with a base hit. Lynn Jones is the tying run with Brett coming up. Looks like a pretty good pitch away. Fastball out over the plate. Lynn Jones, an excellent right field hitter, slaps it to right. That's the interesting thing. He threw him the fastball instead of the scroogey. He usually begins with the scroogey and then starts, as we noted last night, moving the ball inside with the fastball, using Guile to offset the hitter and his ability to guess. So Lynn Jones, who spent the last several seasons in a Detroit uniform, is at first base, and Brett swings and misses, and the count is 0-1. Brett is fly to center, single to center, grounded to second. He is one for seven in the two games. It's a little bit misleading, because he has hit three of those seven outs pretty, pretty hard out back right on the nose. Putting the line drive caught by Gibson as a key play in last night's game. Well, this is what baseball is all about. Sparky's got the guy he wants out on the mound. Hauser's got the hitter he wants up at the plate. You're right. That's what it's all about. Show them. And who's going to be better? Count is one ball and two strikes now on Brett. A little angry with himself. Thought it was a pretty good pitch to hit. I think you're right about that, Al. But in reading it in his face. Well, it looked like he asked Deegan uh, a little high, wasn't it? That's Chased what it. I mean. It was, as I said before, good, was not a good pitch. When to George hit. starts swinging at balls, that's why I think he's angry with us. One, two. Hernandez dropped down and got him. What a beautiful pitch. You get George Brett. May be the sweetest swinger in baseball, regardless of this year's vicissitudes, misfortunes, and low average for him of 284. You get him that way, you're doing some job. Now Hal McRae comes out of the dugout. McRae, a fixture here since 1973, has been platooned as the designated hitter this season with George Orta. Has normally faced simply left-handers. Has hit them well. Two years ago, McRae led the majors in RBIs with 133. Well, he didn't have a bad year as far as average. He just stopped hitting home runs. When I talked to him the other day, he said, you get older, you don't, you just don't swing as hard. Roger Craig coming to the mound. The brilliant Tiger pitching coach. Left alone by Sparky Anderson. It's another bottle of genius of Anderson. The way he delegates, the way he knows the people are hired, how to handle them, when to stay out of the way. You heard him in the pregame show talking about leaving K-Line alone to work with Gibbs. Just an example. The crowd is getting on Deegan. They feel that Craig is spending too much time at the mound as Hauser has already inserted McRae is the pitch hitter here tomorrow. It's the Cubs against San Diego. The matchup, Dennis Eckersley against Ed Whitson. As Chicago tries to sweep, and San Diego tries to stay alive in the National League. The American League Series off tomorrow. Friday night, game three in Detroit. Hal McRae, bothered with the back spasms over the weekend. That's limited. 
his appearances in the batting cage the last couple of nights. Well, if he hits it on the ground at somebody, it's going to be a double play, and he'll be right out of this inning. But he rips it to left field and into the corner for extra bases. The ball following the contour of the wall as Jones rounds third, coming for the plate to gain his time. So they have done what didn't seem possible. They have caught the Detroit Tigers in a late inning. They have done it against Willie Hernandez. season and he got the biggest hit of the season right there at least so far one out one and no the count now what you can expect is after the brilliance of young Saber Hagen we are probably going to see a fellow named Quisenberry the two relief pitches Balboni gets under it, but hooks it down the line, well back into the seats, and well fouled. Two relief pitches that Jim talked about last night before the game. Here's the Hal McRae hit in super slow motion. We'll I'll tell you this. He saw it that way. He counted the stitches. Perfectly timed and shot into the left field corner. What a big hit. One and one on Balboni. Screw ball lifted in the air to right field. Gibson tells Lemon he'll handle it. Two gone. Runners hold. All three Royals pinch hitters tonight have produced. Ward with an RBI single in the seventh. Lynn Jones leading off here in the eighth. And then McRae, three for three off the bench. The orge hit was absolutely critical, made it a one-run ball game. And then, if there was a pitching mistake, Jim, and you're the one most qualified on this, it was Hernandez throwing the fastball to Jones to start this inning, and not the Scrooge. Well, down the hanging screwball, he threw McRae, but it seems what's the most critical, critical is the way Trammell played that jam shot by slot. Instead of the third out, Allowed him to score a run You're last about game. that. Terrible mistake of judgment. I think if you a great honest, ball player does that, that's when you know, as Ralph Houck once wrote, ball players are human too. 0 
0-1 pitch to Frank White. Popped up, foul ground, playable for Parrish sprinting over to make the catch. So the inning is over, but the Royals get even. A run, two hits, two left. Brand new ball game as we go to the ninth. Tied 3-3 in game two. Kansas City after Saber Hagen pitches eight. Quisenberry 44 saves this year. 45 last year. Lynn Jones who hit for Sheridan and singled and came in to score the tying run as the new right fielder as we go to the top of the ninth inning. Dan Quisenberry exceptional this year. He's been exceptional for the last five in fact. Another urgent reminder stay tuned for ABC News Nightline tonight with Ted Koppel for the first time in history an FBI agent has been arrested and accused of selling secrets to the Soviet Union. How serious is it? A look on that story tonight with Nightline where Ted Koppel presides with his usual brilliance and insight. Be with us then. Stay tuned. Roper Jones rounded out, struck out, fly to center. Dan Quisenberry from down under. Strike. One one. So it comes down to this with these two teams, Quisenberry and Hernandez, and Hernandez proving vulnerable and human in his stint this past top of the inning. And now let's see what Dan does. Oh, and he comes up with that underhand thing. So many ways. Well, he's really evolved as a relief pitcher. Came up with just a sinker. Now he's got a changeup, which we just saw. He's got a great curveball. If you're left-handed, you got a chance. If you're right-handed, you're in trouble. I mean, that's just the way it is. Now the way, among the other pitchers he's come up with is a knuckleball. However, Quiz told us the other day. You ain't going to see it in the championship series. And here you see is a very unusual, unorthodox motion. Hitters do not see very many pitches from this position. To call the over in the National League, that's another thing that makes him as effective as he is. But he very rarely throws two pitches the same speed. That is Saberhagen, the 20 year old who performed so well. Oh, it was a lovely scene earlier in the dugout, Al. Why don't you describe it? It came about after Evans flied out at the top of the eighth inning just an inning ago. Evans hit a, a fly ball to deep right. Sheridan made a, a routine play, but the ball was hit, I guess, deep enough that Saber Hagen thought it might be out. But anyway, they get back into the dugout and hugged him. Brett gave him a bear hug as if he'd made the thrill of his life. By the way, don't be misled time. by that towel. Saber Hagen's arm is not hurt. Just encased for warm. Nothing develops. Time has been called. 20 years, five months. Look at that face. Jim mustache. Palmer once looked like that. I never had a mustache. Somebody in the paper here described that mustache today as, a, as an old broom without the bristles. George Brett described it that way, I believe. They room together. Fouled away out of play. Two and two of the count. During Rupert Jones's tenure with the Yankees, he had a critical home run here. I'm not saying he's going to do it now, but he came through with a big blast and is quite capable of hitting it out of here. Jones and then Grubb and then Lemon do up, and when the Royals come up in the bottom of the ninth inning, Slot will start it. Then they've got Bianca Lana and then Wilson. Still two balls and two strikes on Rupert Jones. It's a deceptive hitter, Jim. You remember in the All-Star game a couple of years back when we had it up in Montreal? Hit a big triple. Al? Yep. That was the time uh, Dave Concepcion hit the home run. And uh, Davey was the most valuable, most valuable player. player on the basis of that home run. Full count. <laughs> Jones almost fell over. Well, we talked all night about not getting the low pitch. 
Well, I thought that was a little wide. A little outside, a little low. Yeah. Quisenberry normally 129 innings, only 12 walks. You've got to hit your way on. We know he certainly doesn't want to walk Jones. Lead off the ninth here. And the pitch is outside for ball four. And so Jones walks. Leading off here in the ninth inning. And John Grubb will be the batter. Wasn't very just missing with two straight pitches. And he missed despite the boos of the fans. Wasn't very Jim mentioning how difficult it is to to get aboard. He's not going to help you. But he just did. Normally he's not going to help you. I accept the event. Thank you. What about the bunch, Jim? Let's Visiting see. Sparky, team. I think Sparky's going to punt. Earl doesn't. Well, he doesn't always punt, but uh, to me, this is a Luther Nannis on the uh, mound for your team, Sparky. I, I'd say you got to get the guy in scoring position. A lot of managers, Earl, left-handed hitter up there, says, "Well, hey, we got Balboni holding Rupert Jones over on him first. Let's see if he can hit it in the hole." Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If I was managing, I'd be bunting. But then again, I've never managed. Maybe that's one of the Maybe reasons. Maybe time. <laughs> <laughs> Get a throw to first base. Not only uh, keeping that would make Jones close is Quisenberry. He's also trying to get Grubb to maybe tip his hand as to what he's going to do at the plate. But Johnny hasn't tipped it yet. You realize if Jim won the manage, he and Earl would be at it again. <laughs> Quiz now twice has gone to first. Once he's backed off the rubber, and if Grubb's butting, he's hiding him rather well at this point. He has not yet come up on the bat or begun to square around. Now he does. Lays down the bunt. That'll advance the runner. As Quisenberry makes the play. If Quiz had let that one roll, it might have gone foul. Yeah, but you can't take that risk yet. What if it stays fair? Then the guy, because it's Grubb, might beat it out. But if they, I'm just making the point here. Watch this. Just pointing out what he might have thought about. From that angle, that's a good angle to, to, to show you that it probably, it, the way it looked from there, would not have gone into foul ground. Quiz unable to risk it sacrifice is successful Hauser to the mound and 11 is the batter well Dick has things not exactly uh, his a better angle maybe same angle all right let's go I don't see any question about letting it go foul I mean the ball was fair if he lets it go he's in deep trouble there's no question about it but occasionally if the ball does have some spin on it you might think about it. Al, you're copping out. I am not copping out. <laughs> Let's get Palmer in to settle this arbitration. All I right. take I take the out. And that's what exactly what Quisenberry did. Up you top. both have a very valid point. How's that? Arbitration. <laughs> <laughs> From the truck, they are booing you, and they are quite right. They don't like to see you hedge. You're right. You're right. Howard, he should have let it go foul. How's that? <laughs> what? Lemon swings and fouls it away down the left field line. That's Michael's position. <laughs> what are you talking? Oh, well, on second thought, maybe you're right, Al. <laughs> <laughs> I think basically Quisenberry wants to get Lemon out. They had a meeting, and I guess they probably discussed who he wants to pitch to. Well, Hauser is in a position where he has a chance to win. He's got his man in there. Sparkaroo has his man in there. It's turned out to be a rousing ball game in the late going. In the early going, it was frankly boring. So here we are. One ball and one strike to count on Chet Lemon. Dan Quisenberry. First into prominence when the Royals won the pennant in 1980. He's been extremely reliable since. 45 saves last year set a major league mark which was tied this season by Bruce Souter at St. Louis. 
in the air to left field and over toward the line. Drifts Motley Very playable. to make the catch for the out. Anytime you see a ball like that. Great throw by Motley. The runner, Jones tagging, but he's not going to come. No way. You go back to the late 30s when a very great professional announcer named Red Barber said, look at this throw again. Don't look at the ball. Look at the outfield. Barbaro Garbay now comes up to pinch it for Tommy Brookins. So they go with a right-handed batter against the right-handed hitter. Against the right-handed pitcher as Garbay normally is the DH against left-handed pitching as was the case last night. Look at Barbaro's average there. Look at that graphic. This is a troublesome hitter. And Sparky knows he's in trouble. He's going to have doubts now about Willie because Willie gave up a run. He's going to wonder if Willie is sharp tonight. First time in many months that he has to wonder. So he's got doubts. And Hauser, if Quisenberry gets out of this, Hauser may have the edge. Oh, and one to count. That was between two aggressive managers going on. He'll certainly have the edge in the bottom of the inning. <laughs> well, that's the big advantage of uh, playing at home. Yeah. Like Chris Berry does get. Excuse well, me. Bob Bay is not out. No, not he yet. isn't. Not by a long shot. And the 0 1 to him. He's out. In the air to right center field. Jones is there. And Lynn puts it away to retire the side. Dan Quisenberry gives up the leadoff walk. Then he sets the Tigers down. Kansas City trying to go to Detroit even in the series as they'll come up in the bottom of the ninth. The time for three back after this message and a word from him. Flash with Lawrence Taylor and the New York Giants starting at 9 Eastern on ABC. We're back live. The pitcher on the mound, Aurelio Lopez. I said Sparky Anderson may have had doubts about Hernandez tonight. The doubts have been confirmed. Hernandez had given up the tying run. Marty Castillo now at third base for the Tigers. And Lopez on the mound. Alfalfa to call the action. Don Slaught to lead off, and the pitcher's inside. This is out of sequence for the way the Tigers normally do it. They have used Lopez as the setup man for Hernandez normally, and that's the way it's been working this season. Now Aurelio comes in with a game tied, and Slot slicing it to right field. Gibson on the run and makes the catch, and a good jump by Kirk Gibson off at the crack of the bat and on the run, and with his speed, making the catch for the that first That probably down. would have been a double or a triple last year. Don't forget, Nightline tonight, the FBI agent Soviet intrigue for the first time in the history of our nation. An FBI agent involved. Ted Koppel will bring it to you in Ted Koppel's forthright, direct and yet penetrating and brilliantly insightful way. So stay tuned for Nightline tonight. Critical score. Buddy Biancalana, his first at bat in the championship series, fouling it away as we look again at the catch by Gibson. Well, you're right, Howard. The ball gets by him. It probably would have last year, slicing away. Again, but on the backhanded catch, just as last night, just as he showed in the pregame show, it equates with that catch perfectly. Buddy Biancalana, switch hitter. One and one the count. Buddy, one of six short stops utilized by Hauser this season. One and two. Lopez prone to giving up homers. The Atalanta hit two this season, both left-handed. One recently against the Angels here. Best thing Biancolana got going for him is the fact that he's related to the general manager of station KGO, our own station in San Francisco, which is very relevant. <laughs> Glad you wrote it up. <laughs> two balls and two strikes are down. 
That's it. Swung on late and missed as Lopez just blew it by him. Two down, and Willie Wilson is the batter. Well, Lopez has a good fastball. Throws it right by him. No chance. Good catch up. Willie Wilson hitless tonight. What a time for one of his inside the park home runs. Huh. What a way to end this game. He's one for eight in the series. Ball one, one and oh. Dick Hauser seeking that first ever postseason win. Game tied 3-3 three, three of the night. Two balls, no strikes now. That ball looked like it split the middle of the plate. You see Sparky there saying probably the same, at least thinking the same thing. Ball three. Normally a walk to Wilson is a double. Well, it sure is. And if he walks, you got to send it. No question to lose. Lynn Jones on deck. Taking all the way, and the count is three and one. Well, Sparky said after the game last night, this is a tough team. No game is easy. No team is easy. Ramsey. These are scrappers, these Royals. That's their style, Howard. On paper, they don't compare with the Tigers. On paper. They've got a leader. Lord, how I respect that house. 3-2 huh. pitch. Ball four. So now the winning run is at first base. Lopez knowing it. A walk to Wilson. You know he's going to go. Very often, just like giving up a double. So Lynn Jones is the batter. Wilson, 47 shields, and he was only caught five times this year. But remember here, a part of this depends on Lopez, who quickly manifests the fact that he knows what Willie wants to do. Look at that graphic. Remember, Lopez has a pretty good move, and Parrish is the best there is, as Jim noted early in the game, in throwing out baseballs. The very best. Right, Jim? Yes, but we have a pretty even contest. We have one of the best at first base, so... As you said, I think he's got to send him. Has to. Nothing to lose. Lynn Jones starting the eighth inning rally as you look at the hands of Roger, Roger Craig, Craig, pitching coach. Wilson at first base, held on by Evans. Lopez, after going over three times, backing off the rubber, and now Parrish will go to the mound. Of course, the reason Ali's doing all these things is because he doesn't have a great move. He doesn't have one of those. But no, he Not doesn't bad. have a bad move. But what he's trying to do is step off. He's trying to vary the cadence. He doesn't want Willie to time him. Wilson is not one of these base runners that studies the pitchers as a guy like Ricky Henderson or a guy like Lou Brock or a guy like Maury Wills did. He's just going to out outrun the baseball. He doesn't go and the pitch is a strike. Count 0 and 1. Of course, in this situation, you're hoping that uh, Lynn Jones is going to take a strike, which he did. He's hoping that Willie's going to run. Yeah. Can't really afford to take another one. Think of the pressure on Parrish, too, at this moment, knowing about Wilson. But you got a veteran poised pitcher on the mound. Got a veteran and brilliant defensive catcher behind the plate. And as Jim said, it's an even match because you've got an absolutely brilliant base runner on the pass. There he goes, pitch out. Parrish's throw is right there. Got him. He pitched out and Lance threw a strike down to second. Isn't it interesting that they proved? I realize these people root for their team. But what have we got here? Mobocracy? There you see the perfect throw. What'd you say, Jim? Pat Whitaker, who was playing over towards second, 
right there. Parrish throwing a strike. Again, Nightline following your late local news as we'll be going to extra innings here at Royal Stadium in Kansas City. On to the 10th. Detroit, three. Kansas City, three. Captain Richard Davenport. I'm conducting an inquiry into the events surrounding the death of Sergeant Waters. Alone. You can't possibly get at the truth. Far from home, far from justice. Keep turning this thing over. You bound to have an explosion. He has three days to learn the truth. Your orders instruct you to cooperate. And the truth is a story you won't forget. A soldier's story. Rated PG. Coming Friday to additional theaters. Check newspapers. This buds for everyone who scrapes it, sprays it, and lays it on smooth. Just for you, that distinctively clean, crisp taste that says Budweiser. For all you do. The end of Parrish is throw on the tag right there by Whitaker. Perfect throw. And what a perfect shot. Give the man in the truck credit. An occasional moment of excellence by Chet Foy. What does 40 Chuck, have to do with the replays? Chuck Howard. <laughs> I'll give credit to all of them. <laughs> the second baseman, Lou Whitaker. <laughs> uh, <to> the <laughs> well, I don't know how we're getting home tonight. <laughs> to the 10th inning. Does three, it matter? 3-3 three, three tie. Maybe not. The only important thing is that Jimmy is with us. Whitaker hits a ground ball to short. Beyond Galata. Over to Balboni for the out. One away. Trammell comes up. Alan Trammell, one for four. After the perfect night last night when he reached base five times. Three for three plus two walks. This is going to kind of sound like a, somewhat of an understatement, but he had a grand slam this year off of Quisenberry. And this is a guy Quisenberry has to be very careful about. Oh, and one to count. Anyway, to go back to my understatement, yeah. normally, Quisenberry doesn't pitch in tie ball games. What do you mainly, mean by that? Well, mainly they don't like to use him in tie games because then he's not available the next night to save a game. But uh, due to the importance of this game, with an off day tomorrow, they're going to use him. I got news for you. If they don't use him tonight, there's no time ever to use him again. Well, you're right. That's why I said that's that the, was an understatement. That's the point James was making. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. We're seeing something a little bit out of the ordinary here. No balls, two strikes to count. And down goes Trammell on three pitches. Five straight set down by Quisenberry, and with two down, it'll be Gibson coming up. Impossible pitch to hit, really. Well, you've got this classic showdown here. Quisenberry, and now it happens to be Lopez instead of Hernandez. But the ultimate strengths of the two teams right before the American public. And this kid having a big night and a big series and improving with every game, it seems, both in the field and at the plate. An extra innings. Can't ask for more out of baseball. Two out of the base is empty and the pitch missing low ball one. As I said, I I just from watching Quisenberry pitch over the years, the right handers don't have a much of a chance. If he's going to give up a home run, even though he did give up that grand slam to Trammell. Line to center. Only the left handers give him trouble. Wilson staying with it and making the catch. Gibson ripping it. But right at Willie Wilson. And Quisenberry sits him down in order. Jones will lead off, followed by Brett Norda. Bottom of the tenth, we're tied 3-3. Back after this word from your local station. Jim Palmer, Kansas City. Game two of the American League Championship Series. Tigers got two in the first. Gibson homered in the third. That made it 3-0. Norda drove in a run in the fourth to make it 3-1. A couple of key plays in this inning. Alan Trammell. His misplay, keeping the inning alive, Ward eating up Whitaker, and then 
The Graves double tied it in the eighth. Lynn Jones in the bottom of the tenth inning. Jones with a pinch single in the eighth inning and staying in the game. Brett is on deck, and then you go to the DH's spot where they've already used Orta and McRae, and Watson would fill that role right now since he pitch ran. Asking for time was Jones, but it wasn't granted, and the pitch was a strike. And the count 0 and 2. Right now, the rule is you don't get time. If the ball's a strike or a ball, the umpire's just going to call it whatever it is. Up to the umpire to grant it, and he did. Brett next. Fouled away, still no balls and two strikes. Tigers, as you look at the Grays double, it's doubled by Hal on the first pitch he saw from Hernandez tying the game of the eighth inning. Tigers had the best record in the league in extra innings this year, 11 and 2. Royals were 6 and 5. That's fouled back. And it is still nothing and two on Lynn Jones. Again fouled away. Lynn Jones came up with the Tigers in 1979. Spent five seasons with Detroit. And then the Royals signed him as a free agent last winter. Good guy to have on your bench. Good defensive player. Line drive to left field. But right there is Jones. And so one Jones lines out to the other as Rupert Hit pulls it. it in. Hit it well, though, and now you've got George Brett. And that may be an argument. Nobody's going to say this is the greatest baseball game ever played. I will say that this showdown, this situation, is picture perfect for the kind of game baseball is. Six dull innings, no question about it. And suddenly, the Royals scrapping, under man next to the other team, and yet with enough players and leadership to keep fighting back all year long, putting on a show. It's what Tom Boswell of Amherst in the Washington Post or Jim Murray of Trinity College in the L.A. Times or Roger Kahn of Columbia and the boys of summer, what the great writers understand about the beauty of baseball. Frank DeFord of Princeton and Sports Illustrated. Let's give the great writers their due. They know this business. Did they all go to college? <laughs> you know, they ones? did. Okay, back to the game. One ball and one strike on Brett, who rips it into right field that. for a base hit. So the winning run is on as George Brett singles. Hauser's got a decision here to make, too. Brett less than 100%. Do you pitch run for George with one out of the 10th inning? And he had been doing that in similar situations late in the regular season. Brett looking over toward the dugout. But George will probably stay in the way it looks right now. I really think if I had my choice to watch any one batter in baseball in a given situation, it would be George Brett. I just think he's such a perfect hitter. John Watson comes up for the first time tonight. He is in the DH spot since he pinch ran for McRae. Used to be the number one catcher, and then Schwab took over. Strike had a real bad year offensively. Well, they, first, they, guys, excuse me, how they they learned how to pitch to John. John is primarily a right field hitter, not a whole lot of power, and you run the ball in on him, you really can't do much with it. Once you learn that, it makes getting John Wappen out pretty easy. Only hit about 180 this year. Really didn't have much of an opportunity to play. Of course, his one strength is that. Other than being a pretty good team player, is that he's an exceptional runner for a catcher. No balls and two strikes the count. Aurelio Lopez. 
used to go by the nickname, still does, I guess, if it's applicable. Senor Smoke, when he was the main man out of the Tiger Pen, a role now filled by Hernandez. Duke's wife, Nancy. Not an easy moment for her. She's had the bitterness of hearing the Royals fans boo her husband this year. Not easy either. Yeah, it's got a piece of it. Still 0-2. Motley is on deck. 3-3 tie at the bottom of the tenth inning. Here's Darrell. Very much a must situation, a must-win situation for Kansas City with the balance of this series to be played at Tiger Stadium. Game three coming up on Friday after tomorrow's off day. Fly ball to center. Right to Lemon. So two down as Waffen flies out. And Motley is the batter. Lopez has had no trouble with him in Motley's brief career. Inside. If you want to pitch to Daryl Motley, you want to keep the ball inside, but right now is a perfect situation. Lopez has to throw a strike. Motley likes the ball out over the plate. And if you hit one in the gap here, this game's over. If you hit one in the gap. Yeah. Right into the hole and that's a base hit. So Brett pulls in at second. Winning run at second base now. You want to know something, Jim? He didn't hit that good a pitch. And yet he pulled the ball when maybe he should have gone to right. And it went into the hole between short and third. Look at it. No, it was it was enough over the plate to pull it. Well, he's looking fastball, and it was down, but in the middle of the plate. Now they're going to pinch run for Brett. We suggested that Hauser had to be thinking about it. And now that he's the winning run at second base, that makes the difference as far as Dick Hauser is concerned. And Greg Pryor, who would stay in the game at third base if we go to an 11th inning, is the man. Don't you love to see an underdog like this fight this way? Now it's Balbo. Vulnerable in the strikeout sense. And it's on one on speed. So Pryor at second. A lot of the Royals will tell you that Pryor may have been the most valuable player on this team. That's this what year. Brett says, and that's what Frank White says, because and that's what in. Willie Wilson says. So that's pretty good testimony. He's done a great job filling in because of all of the injuries, especially as in the case of Brett early in the season and then partially down the stretch. Count, no balls, two strikes on Balboni. I think if he scores here, he'll get a few get more Get the man moves. on first. He means nothing. One gets a sense now that it's the Tigers who are struggling, which doesn't mean the game will end in favor of the Royals. Oh, backhanded by Parrish. One ball, two strikes to count. Well, we said going into this series, it's going to be guys like Balboni that are going to have to get key hits. He didn't do it in the fourth inning. There you see Lopez missing by about four feet. Parrish up and in. He almost wild pitched it all the way to the screen, low and away. They're going to win. It's going to be the guys like Balboni come up with a big hit. He couldn't do it in the fourth, but he'll do it now. Stayed alive. Look at that little tiger. So to speak. Tight. 
That little tiger would like to beat the Tigers. I know. Like to do. And the stud went big, though. Wasn't hard. Out of the way. Well, when you start talking about animals, I'm going to clarify it, right? <laughs> You're always there, Alfalfa. <laughs> One ball, two strikes on Balboni with a winning run at second. Fouling off another one. And Palmer lives in the city where the ex-owner always said hi, Tiger, to everybody. Mr. Ursa was created the Indianapolis Pilgrims, who left in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness on the Mayflower. Again fouled away. 3-3 three, three time. Bottom of the tenth inning. Well, what Steve's done is fouled away some pretty good breaking balls. I would think they try to go up and in. Break them out with a high fastball right here. And Balboni pops this one in foul ground over toward the dugout and drifting back Forget in about it. six rows. Balboni is fighting, staying alive. See a big man like this up there. Worked so hard, so long in the minors. Thirsting for the chance. Yankees in their situation, be fair to them, couldn't suffer the strikeouts. How's it good? And now, with an opportunity to win a big one. And again, fouling it away. I think that's what, six? Big as he is, Open. as raw as he looks, so sensitive as a human being. Running run prior at second base. Once more, the one-two pitch to him. Hit in the air to left center field. It's and Levin is out. there. Chet gets underneath it and makes the catch to retire the side. So no runs, two hits in the inning. They strand the winning run at second base. Brett is also now out of the ball game as we go to the 11th inning, and Pryor will be taking over at third. Parrish will be leading off with the Tigers. Again, Nightline, to follow your late local news. The subjects are reflected there to be discussed on Nightline tonight as we proceed to the top of the 11th inning. Game two at Royal Stadium in Kansas City after 10. It's the Tigers three and the Royals three. Staying in the game at third base as we proceed to the 11th inning at Royal Stadium in Kansas City. Tigers winning last night 8-1. to one. Led here tonight 3 nothing. But the Royals have battled from behind. Tied it up. Dan Quisenberry on in relief in his third inning of work right now. And Parrish will start things off. Dennis Eckersley goes to the mound as the Cubs seek to clinch the National League pennant tomorrow against Ed Whitson of the San Diego Padres. And then on Friday, we'll be with you from Tiger Stadium in Detroit. Charlie Lebrant scheduled for KC. Milt Wilcox for Detroit. Parrish in the 11th takes inside ball one. That's what's interesting about baseball, even the names. Lebrant, a virtual unknown to the American people, against Wilcox, very well known. On the surface, a mis mismatch. But look at this game tonight, Jim. Right. You know what's going to happen? Would you think a young pitcher, 20 years old, would be able to hold the Tigers to three runs, especially after giving up two in the first? Listening to Dick Hauser, I did. One ball, two strikes to count. Watching Dwight Gooden. Darling and the rest of the there is Brett Saberhagen. The underlying story of the Royals fight right now for survival. Young pitches of the game today. It's over for you. Pop foul and 
Costa back on the screen. You got the picture. <laughs> Vivid. <laughs> Young relief pitches. Do you? Tim? Don't want young relief pitches? Yeah. I like the fellas like Quisenberry, Hernandez, Gossage, Smith. Smith. I like those guys that throw 99 miles per hour. Rigetti's not a bad young relief pitcher. 31 saves? You're right. I would not characterize him as bad. Might not categorize him as a relief pitcher if he had his brothers either. <laughs> Neither would I. If you want to get to the point. <laughs> two balls, two strikes. The count on Parrish. Evans is on deck. And then Jones. And it's a liner off the glove of Pryor and out into left field. Motley gets it back in, and so Parrish starts things in the 11th inning with a leadoff single. A righty against Quisenberry, Jim. There we see Pryor trying to catch the ball. Reflected off his glove. Quicker guy than Lance Parrish might be thinking double coming out of the box. When you're that big, you just don't run that fast. Alex Gravis gets in a word with Evans, who's hit the ball in the air four times tonight. He's 0 for 4, fly to left once and to right three times. Dangerous batsman. No let up in this Tiger lineup. The depth of this team, really exceptional. In a like situation in the ninth inning, Grubb laid down a bunt. Fryer has to play in shallow at third to guard against that possibility. I punt. I think this is one of those situations, though, that with the hole at first, you might swing away. Hope to get that first and third situation. A little unorthodox, but I certainly did see Earl Weaver and other managers do that, and it's worked quite. Evans has only had one sacrifice punt, by the way, the whole season. Well, he's not the kind of guy that's going to lay down a lot during the year unless the situation dictates it. And it does right here, and he takes outside. Ball one. One and oh. Got to go back to 73. How to many? An 11 inning AL championship game. How many of you win that game? Two. I don't know. 20, 21, 22, something like that. I was in a rut back then. <laughs> Parrish at first base with nobody out, top of the 11th inning, a 3-3 tie in Kansas City. Something I want you to know quickly. If you don't go back, we'll be in the Hall of Fame. You know that. You should be. 1-0 pitch. Evans running foul, and the count is 1-1. One one. You don't have to win 300. That's just a number. The winder never did. Don Dreisler, and he's in, and you'll be in, too. So just know that. Okay. Your engine. Start Thank right you. in this beach. <laughs> I didn't know you were on the committee, though, Howard. Of course, with your influence, I'm sure that this <laughs> kudo you just threw me will help. Either that <laughs> or... Well, yes, the rapport that you have with the media around this country, I... I'm in. Thank you. Do I have to wait the five years? That's the question. I would. I would. Evans lays down the butt this time. Very good one, and he is 
was aboard at first base as Schlott couldn't pick it up. So a perfect punt that would have moved the man along and the added bonus of first and second now and nobody out. For a guy who only had one sacrifice punt all year, another evidence of the mysteries of baseball. No question that Slot has him if he picks it up cleanly. And now runners at first and second in a bunting situation once again as they discuss strategy as to how they'll cover this one. On the mound again, a look in super slow motion at Slot. One of those plays, as you said, you know that Evans doesn't run that well. You just want to pick up the ball, but it looks like he just doesn't pick it up. Very simple. <laughs> That's what it looks like. <laughs> Failed to make the play. So now Jones is the batter. Runners at first and second and nobody on in the top of the 11th inning. This guy is due. And what Hauser was talking about was what the assignment was going to be. There's so many variations of the bunt defense. As Earl Weaver said today, a lot of times it looks so easy to sacrifice, but in this situation, you have two or three plays you can use that'll make it very difficult to get that runner. Do you have to Jones? You have Definitely. To. And in the air, and Slot can't make the catch. Diving for it. So after his error, the recipient now of a big ovation on a great effort by Don, just out of his reach. of inches then and when he went to pick it up on the play before. Quisenberry getting together with Pryor. Pitcher can really help himself if he's a good fielding pitcher in this particular situation. Well the plays that you work Al on one you throw the ball you run over to third you're trying to feel the ball and force the guy at third and then another situation you'll go to first base the third baseman will come in and the shortstop will try to beat the runner on second the third base for the force. A little bit different responsibility as you break towards first base, and another variation is a pickoff play. Time call. Talk about good fielding pitches. Cubs had a pitcher on the mound today, a very good pitcher. Steve Trout did a heck of a job, but a very poor fielding pitcher. What did you guys used to do to Tommy John? Used to try to bunt because we couldn't hit him. We used to bunt on Trout every time we could. Throwing 95 miles per hour, sometimes a little bit easier to bunt on a guy than try to hit him. Good bunt, fielded by oh, Quisenberry to third, and he gets the force. Dan is not the most graceful or nimble coming off the mound, but he handled that one flawlessly and perfectly. Well, and bunted it right to back to him. It's a poor bunt. Look at this. It's a poor bunt position. on Astor, Exactly. He broke off the mound. Third base side. Ball was, a, as you said, a poor bunt on turf. Right to him. Only thing you want to do there is not throw it away, and he didn't. You can see Slot yelling third. Serving as the traffic cop. Pryor retreating to the bag. 1-5 on the four. Still met at first and second. And Grubb is the batter. John 0 for 3 tonight. is at second. Jones is at first. Fouled away. No balls, one strike. Bottom of the inning. It'll be the bottom of the order for Kansas City. White, Slaughter, and Deontalana. Quisenberry's longest outing of the season was a four inning stand against California last week. 
And again, the Royals won in 12. Right, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth innings. He said that was it. He was cooked. Balboni got the big hit. Double over Downing's head in left field to win that ball game. Very important game. Dan in his third inning tonight. One ball, two strikes. They appeal, but don't get the call at third. Bob Jones, third base on fire. He didn't come around. It's an interesting pitch. You have a sinker ball pitcher trying to pitch up and in to a left-handed hitter, which is the place to pitch grub. Shows you the versatility of Quisenberry. As I said before, in 1980, only had a sinker ball. Now he has three other pitches to go with it, which is probably why he's even more effective than he was back then. In the gap toward right center field, racing back is Wilson, and it's over his head. At least one run will score as Evans comes around third, and he will score, and behind him comes Jones as the Tigers now lead by two. Johnny Grubb ripping one to the gap for a double in right center. And the Tigers lead five to three. So the unending strength of this Detroit team. So many different people with capacities to do what has to be done. And a scrappy, plucky Kansas City team against them. Coming back in a manner not done but a couple of times all year long against this Detroit team. But the ultimate manpower belonging to the Tigers. They really, and they haven't won yet, but they are some baseball team. Here's Lemon fouling into the plate, and the count is nothing and one. Chet Lemon, 0 for 4 tonight. Only and one out for nine, not series. done yet, Al. Now with Lemon, there's John Johnny Grubb. Grubb. One time All Star when with San Diego. The much traveled player, but a role player in this team that in its own way resembles the very great Baltimore team of a year ago. When, as Jim Palmer said, so many players had career years. Lemon trying to bunt his way aboard, fouling it away, and the count is no balls and two strikes. So Royal Stadium, so vibrant and so alive in the seventh, eighth, and ninth, still right now, and some of the people beginning to leave. Night line to follow again. This is a very important show for the first time in the history of our country. An FBI agent involved with Soviet intrigue. And Teddy Koppel to bring it to you. Very critical show that relates to the whole strength and inner being of our nation. And Koppel's the man to tell you about, to interview the people. How do you really feel about Ted? I think he's one of the most brilliant men I've ever known. How do you feel about him? I, I echo that. Absolutely. How come they don't boo in the trucks when you cop out, Al? That's what I want to know. <laughs> what do you cop out? You're making a career of that. One two pitch is driven to left field. And the catch is made by Motley as Grubb remains at second base, and there are two down. The third baseman, Marty Castillo. Castillo is the batter. Marty comes up for the first time in the game. Third different third baseman tonight. Last night, he started. Sparky's going to use him against left-handed pitching and that means he'll be in the starting lineup on Friday when Charlie Lebrand takes the mound for Kansas City. One more example of the versatility he can also catch. Slice down the line foul and the count is 0-1. Howard you said this is a funny game. A lot of quirks. He'd probably walk rub if Rupert Jones. One of the best books about baseball, to use the phrase you just used, written many years ago, was written by Joe Garagiola. Baseball is a funny game. 
and it was a very insightful book, and he's absolutely right. And this game proves it. Grounded a short, Biancalana over to first to retire the side, but in the inning. Two runs, two hits, it was a big error. It meant a run by Slot, and at the end of 10 and a half, 5 3, Detroit. Bottom of the 11th inning, Kansas City trailing in the game now 5 to 3 in a must win situation. Only one team in the history of either the American or National League Championship Series has erased an 0 2 deficit, and that was Milwaukee in 1982. And they did it, if there is an easy way, they did it the easier way because they went home and won three. No team's ever lost two at home and come back to win three on the road, and that's the prospect that will be facing Kansas City if they lose this one. As White leads off by hitting the first pitch in the air to center field, Lemon went back but comes charging in to make the catch. One away. It's a very kind of thing. Lemon may be the best in the business. Uh, an extraordinary center fielder anyway. He has an almost instantly reflex ability, even if he misjudges a ball as he did there to recapture and come in on a ball the way he just did. Looks like an easy play in the long run, but not because of the beginnings of it. Dodge Slot is 0 for 4. Fouling it away, and the count is 0-1. Aurelio Lopez is the man tonight for Sparky Anderson after Hernandez had come in, pitched one inning, and for only the second time in 1984, failed to produce in a situation in which he had a save in front of him. Line drive, center field, base hit. So the Royals would at least get the tying run to the plate. On a single to center by Don Slott, Biancalana is due up, but UL Washington, the erstwhile Kansas City shortstop, will come up to bat for him. And another tough, underrated bat. Good contact hitter. Knows how to get on. We go back to House's use of... Uh, the earlier use of Dane Orch. Hauser's had success tonight. Every time he's gone to his bench, Orch with a single. Jones then singled in the eighth to lead to the tying run, which was produced on McRae's double. Pinch hitters have been three for three, and the switch hitting Washington up here right now. Ball one. UL hampered by injuries this season. Thus, he was limited to appearing in only 63 games. Minus the toothpick takes a strike. One and one. He's the last, last man on the bench, Howard, outside of the pitchers. Has occasional power. Can surprise you with it. Well, normally, you just pitch him away and play him that way. I hope he hits it at somebody. There you saw Lopez throw the ball right by him. One and two. On deck is Willie Wilson. Really, his best power at being a switch hitter is against left-handed pitching from the right side. Another thing, as Al said, he had a shoulder problem, had the ankle problem, but hasn't really played that much. He's used to playing every day. Hasn't had that opportunity this season. Two and two, and even though he's healthier, the way Concepcion played in the second half of the season, at least right now, it appears that Onyx is going to be Kansas City's regular shortstop. He was going to have a tough time winning his job back. Down he goes. And the Tigers are now away. Better fielder. Well, you're not 10 and 1. Not having a good fastball. There he just throws it right by him. Very tardy. Just another manifestation of the depth of strength of this Detroit team. You said early on, very simply, Jimmy, Sparky has the horses. He does, but he really uses them well. Well, he's the first one to admit that. He said, great players make a great manager. And I'm a perfect example, but I think he's being a little bit too humble because, as you All said, right. he's, he's done a great job. 
I get the feeling that he would win just about anywhere he would go. You're right, absolutely. He's proved at the very start of the telecast when Al opened the actual game show. He talked about the hurt in Sparky Anderson, the still not fully explained or disclosed circumstances under which the Reds dismissed him. But he's a remarkable man. These two managers are really beautiful to watch. Meanwhile, for Hauser, the frustration continues. 0-7 coming in in postseason. Slot is at first base. Royals are down to their final strike, and the 0-2 pitch to Wilson nearly hits him. We can keep it alive. You've got Lynn Jones on deck. Not exactly the power hitter you'd want for the occasion. No, but maybe you can hit one in the gap. And you'd be tied again, especially with Wilson at first base. If he did, we'd have a scoop. Yep. Willie Wilson hitless tonight. Little chopper. That's going to be a very tough play. He's a hit. Fly and Forget it. The winning run will come to the plate. So an infield single for Willie Wilson to put runners at first and second and two down. And Lynn Jones coming up, who has singled and fly to left. Maybe we can get that scoop, pal. Uh, a roof shot. Smart play by Castillo. You know the guy that's hitting. You know it's Willie Wilson. You know you have no chance. You're not risking throwing it away, putting the possible tying run at second. He just holds on to it. Foul tip. No balls, one strike. Isn't that interesting? Who would guess before this game began that the man who may have gotten the game winning blow would be Johnny Grubb? Out of all of the great names here. Foul away, and so again, Kansas City down to one last strike with a count nothing and two. The point I tried to make last inning is that if Rupert Jones bunts them over successfully, they walk Grubb and pitch to Lemon. So sometimes things don't work out the way you want them to, but they do work out. O2 pitch to Jones is popped up in foul ground. Back to the screen comes Parrish, no, but no. no, doesn't have room. No chance. Tying run at first base. There's the runner at second. Slot. Willie Wilson, that's a good man to have is the tying run. Hit one down the line or into the gap, and you get a tie ball game. Well, he's the type of guy Al that can score on a long single with that kind of speed. When he gets going, covers a lot of ground in a hurry. And also, you got the advantage with first and second. If they're not going to hold him on, so he gets a big lead and a big jump. And the pitch on the way is lined to right field, but a right to Gibson. And the Tigers go home to Detroit, needing one win for the American League pennant as the Tigers win it in 11 innings in Kansas City by a score of 5-3. to three. So Johnny Grubb with the game-winning hit, a double in the 11th inning. And then Lopez does the job to win it to beat Quisenberry. Gibson hits the only homer in the game, and we'll talk to you on Friday from Detroit. Al Michaels, Jim Palmer, Howard Cosell. Good night from Kansas City. The final score in 11, Tigers 5, and the Royals 3. A look there at Brett Saberhagen remaining in the dugout through it all after eight well-pitched innings, keeping his team in the game. Join us again tomorrow for Game 3, the National League Championship Series.